Welcome into the Cam and Strip Podcast, episode number 192, presented by Hair Club. And I may have a hair in my throat, to be honest with you, Cam. I am coughing like a mug, man. I am man, just coughing everywhere right now. I'm sorry, dude. Andy's in South Carolina. And I had a golf tournament today, and we usually bang these things out early. And now he's got to wait for me to get home. And I kind of fucked you over today, and I, I got to apologize off the bat, homie. I'm sorry. Well, you yes, want, you do. I yes, didn't you do. I, I know. But I didn't want to be in the goddamn tournament, dude. They they auctioned me off, so there's money involved. There's charity involved. And I couldn't get the fuck out of there. It was the slowest goddamn par three tournament, Andy. I swear to God. And I'm trying to call you and pick up, and I, I'm sorry. So tell the wifey and the kiddos, Uncle Cam, sorry. I am, seriously, though. Well, dude, you're such an amateur. Yeah, You don't know how to leave. You just get up and walk out. You got to be somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Listen, everyone's been in that golf tournament where you have, like, a, a foursome, and I've been in lots of golf tournaments. In fact, I'm getting a lot of people reaching out right now, Cam, asking me to play some, yeah. some golf with them. So... But you ever been in a golf tournament, a scramble where one person has to leave early, so they just leave? I mean, uh, that's all you got to do is just get up and leave. Yeah, but the difference between me and you, Andy, is like people bid on me to like play in their foursome. They they they're not doing that with you, so they spend. Oh, they will. Yes, they will. Well, yes, they will. The reason why I couldn't just leave is because they spent twenty two hundred dollars to have me around them all day, or I would have left. This isn't just me and my buddies. It was for a Mm. huge auction and tournament, so. My bad. It though. sounded like it was you and your buddies. The way you made it sound like it was well, you and your, your buddy uh, Tim. Well, they spend the money on me, but you know it's it's guys. It's your buddies, people. dude. Don't act like you talk people you don't know. It's like you know no. these guys very very well. Who you business call wise, today. yeah, Andy. It's not like fucking Jason or Travis. It's like business. So yeah. I consider them my buddies, but it's business. And they spent I the gotcha. money. I couldn't leave, dude. I couldn't leave. I swear to God, I'm sorry. I gotcha. All good, man. All good. What's going on, dude? What's the latest? I don't know. I don't know. I suck at golf. I re- I came home 100 miles an hour. You already you, you told me you hate me. You said that uh, Lori's waiting to go out to eat. I'm fucking rattled. I tried. And then, and then goddamn, I, I, it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon here, so there's traffic. And I was kind of like, I don't know. I busted my ass home. So that's what's going on. I didn't do shit on the course. It kind of rattled me, and now I'm here, and now there's no hockey to watch for another three months, so I, I don't know what to think. Did you embarrass yourself on the course today? Uh, kind of. Did you embarrass the brand? I mean, Cam, no. listen, it's funny because, you know, you like to poke fun at others, including myself on the yeah. golf course, but in well, reality, yeah. you need me with you when you golf just to kind of bring some entertainment along with it so that everyone's not making fun no. of you. No, I'm JoJo the Circus Clown. I, I don't need another one. Like, yeah. I, I know what to do. But I was okay. It's a par three. I, I could hit my, my irons here and there, but it is what it is, dude. But it kind of sucks there's no hockey on anymore, man. I'm trying to find some cool shit to watch, and I, I don't know. I feel like there's just I, there's nothing to watch now. Like, hey. I got to watch the Cardinals and stuff, but it's like, oh, what, what am I going to do? I want this fire and ice thing coming out, that, like, Game of Thrones sequel. I can't wait for that shit. Mm. Did you watch the first Game of Thrones? Was it, like, I never really got into that. Oh, God. It's badass, man. It really is. Really? Yeah, except for the White Walkers and like the magic shit. I like the mm-hmm. political side of things. It reminds me of being back in like the twelve hundos. You know, like, I think that's where it is, where all the castles are starting being built and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It's interesting, man. The political side is very interesting. The dialogue's unbelievable. The set pieces are great. I didn't like the White Walkers and dragons and shit. Eh, I just like uh, kingdoms going at each other. That's cool to me. Huh. Cam, I just drove 13 hours in the minivan, dude. I mean, I just, uh, I'm thinking maybe I'll just get one of these minivans. I rented one. The kids destroy it, which is part of the deal. You just let them kind of destroy it. But yeah, I kind of like these minivans. I'm not going to lie. They're sufficient, dude. They are. You don't need a big old Tahoe. If you want to save coin, get a goddamn minivan. You could probably get an electric one, too, or a, or a whatever, whatever it is, like a, uh, you know, a, a both, whatever, hybrid thing. I should say. <laughs> yeah. Minivans, look, you look very nerdy. I tend to goddamn windows. So, like, you're, you know, like people are creepos aren't looking at your kids and shit when you're driving. I don't know. Um, but yeah, those are fine, dude. But like, I might make funny if I see you, but who cares? You can't tint the windows on a minivan, dude. Like, that, that looks like that's like a sketch, like the most sketchy vehicle on the. On the road is a, is a minivan with tinted windows, right. like Save the money. low like the low rider minivans. You ever seen those back in the day? No, Purple no. minivan, no. low rider, and it's got like tinted windows, dude. I'm not driving one of those. Well, I don't hang out with people that 
low ride their minivan anyway. And your your high school buddy <laughs> probably did that. But I, my point is like you tent the windows so like the sun doesn't beat down on your children. Yeah, like it, like it saves you money. Like it's nice. You don't want people creeping in there. What the kind of money part... is that tension in the window saves you money? Like explain yeah. that one. Well, how about like oh here let me let me tell you like sun goes into normal windows easier than when you put five percent tin on those mugs. Well, what's the how's it saving well, you money? Well, of air conditioning bills. I mean, like well, what are you talking maybe, about? Maybe though, I I should say if you want to do it to your <laughs> house. You could, well, I'm going to tint the windows in my house because I have a billion windows and there's sun beats down on it. Like I tint them. You know, look fine. It might save you money on on your bill. I, I shouldn't have said that with the car, but it it keeps your car cool, dude. It does. And then you can like yeah, pick your yeah. nose and shit. No one's looking at you. I don't know. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. Did you ever have a lowrider? Did you ever like know well, anybody that drove a lowrider back in the day? Like a lowrider right. truck? What do I look like to? <laughs> no, man. I, I don't care about that. I, I was doing. Uh, I did a muscle Corvette thing. I did a. I did the five oh. mark thing. My dad got me that. I had a. Fire, a fire 88 firebird formula with a 350 in that it was kind of cool mm -hmm. um but those are those are shitty the corvette was kind of cool for a bit I, I i'm not into fast cars i don't know enough about them i want a big truck that's safe and maybe uh you know I, my, my wife has a nice little bmw that's cool it saves gas like it's nice it's cute i gotta put fatty fuck tires on it and tint the goddamn windows but very i just want to be very very, very small dinky. wheels you're right, right andy they're dinky <laughs> wheels <laughs> and i don't like it and i i'm like oh girl we just gotta I want some black rims on that mug. Make it look badass. She looks, hey, I want her to look I like a badass it. bitch. I love it when when I'm mad at Cam. Cam will just he will not be combative. He he will be like Mr. Nice Guy. He will be so nice. Like and that's what you're doing. Well, I'm not mad. My wife was just like, "What's going on here?" I told her we were going to do it at 2:30 today. Sorry, homie. So now look at this. People at home can't see it right now, but I'm in a beautiful uh, ballroom. Uh, if I ever had to get married again, I may have to just do it right here, right here in this ballroom. There like were no ballroom. Man. Well, there were no there were no ballrooms available, so this is like the smallest one that's up here. And I found a guy who works there. I said, "Hey, dude, can I get in there?" Because you do? I got, do you do? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Whatever. I got what kicked out of our suite because like everyone's showering and stuff, dude. I can't be doing uh, that one. You know, you, you know no, you go know, back in or, there. Go, go back in there, Andy. <laughs> no, but what are you doing with the kids in South Carolina, though? Like, have you seen any gators? Like anything cool? I mean, don't bore me to death with your stories, but, like, is there anything cool that you're going to do? Well, there's a lot of things that are cool around here. First off, in terms of the gators, I saw some gators in the uh, lagoon today. There was a yeah. sign that, that like, warned you about, like, not going in the lagoon. Don't fuck with that. And somebody ha had offered me a kayak, dude, to take his kayak out into the lagoon. But there are gators in there, dude. He followed it up by saying that. So I've got some reservations on that. I'm a little bit uh, nervous of the uh, stingrays, dude. Like, there's stingrays that are everywhere in the ocean around here. Uh, the crocodile hunter about that, man. Like, they're hardcore. They'll get you. You know there's no alligators in the ocean, though. Like, you know that, right? They don't go in salt water. I mean, they can go back and forth a little bit. Yeah, the salt well, water. No, they don't go back and forth. They, they, they don't go in the ocean. Okay, they're crocodiles, then, and they look different. They got a skinnier nose, but go ahead. Oh, that's the difference? Yeah. Alligators got a bigger nose than a crocodile. Yeah, they got a fatter, fatter width of their beak, or their 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 snout is fatter than a, a crocodile. But can you see those fatter. videos that are out there, like people who live in Florida, maybe Australia, and they're like friends with the alligators. Like the they, they pet the alligators. They come up to the boat. Their yeah. mouth opens. They feed them. They kiss yeah. them on the nose. Dude, have yeah. you seen those? Yeah, yeah, of course, man. Just go to anywhere in Florida. They have like those places every two miles. What are you talking about? Yeah. It's the that's not a big deal because they go for the food and they're adjusted to they know they're going to eat. What's cool is when you go to the Amazon and you see these good old fucking native boys down there and they actually have pet crocs that come up and they swim with each other and they feed them. But they're they're lovey dovey with each other. Check that out on YouTube. My bet my best or it's called like my best friend pet or something unique pet as a best friend. And they'll show all these different animals with with their owners and how they they treat them like a dog. It's weird. That's cool. But when you're like, oh, the guy has food and he puts up a kiss, <laughs> and I have it everywhere, Andy. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. It should be a criminal. That should be a crime because you're asking for it, dude. You shouldn't be messing with these alligators. But the sharks, dude, I don't mess with. I I, I gotta be honest. When I go in the ocean, dude, I'm very uncomfortable. Man. My, my anxiety is through the roof. Like, it's not the same when I'm in the Caribbean or if I'm uh, like in like, uh, you know, the south of France or something like that, where like, you know, you're in that beautiful sea 
where you can Freezing see cold like, water, well, you, you, where you, you can you can oh, see and you can see your toes dude when you're in the water like it's so clear France. it's so clear yeah in south of france dude like in nice oh dude yeah may, maybe there i would say it's maybe. the most refreshing yeah experience i've ever had that's where i would send like you you hear like brian boyle like how he sent his dad like to like a a, a very like religious place where yeah. there's healing powers yeah. like Dude, there's there's probably places like that where I was at in in, in uh, Nice too. Like you go in the water, you just feel yourself getting healed. Like the refreshing, it's so refreshing. Uh, salt water heals you anyway, you know. Well, like if you, you have, have like, like a zits, if you have zits on your face or something, you get in the ocean, like you're gonna clear up pretty quick, you know. Or you is have that like what a, it does. Uh, well, yeah, it's salt water, man. It's like putting peroxide on yourself. Oh, yeah. And so anyway, so quiet, what? Well, Jeez. when I'm in the ocean, I get very, uh, I get very nervous, dude. Man, I, that I, 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 I kind of scared. I, I kind of need you to stay alive, homie. Like I don't trust your you and your weak swimming. And when that that current gets you, like I, I don't know, like it, it'll it'll take you far, far away, Andy. Like you don't got the power to swim back. <laughs> Be careful. With that. I'm like I'm a curious. message in a bottle, man. Well, just... It's just like that one little wave will suck you right out there. You're like a, they're kind of like a child. You have to like protect you. Well, the beaches and the ocean here in the States, specifically on the East Coast, the Atlantic Ocean, I feel like is infested with sharks. Like, once you get out of Florida, where there's sharks in Florida, too, but, like, oh, dude, yeah. you get to the Outer Banks in North Carolina, South Carolina, up the Jersey Shore. Like, I just feel like there's sharks everywhere. Well, because they go through the water pattern, dude. There's, like, a current that goes through, and they just find the current, and they go through it, and they loop back around and shit. Would so, you rather have a uh, confrontation with a shark or a bear, dude? Like, I mean, honestly, because um, those are my two biggest fears. I told my family on the way out here, a 13-hour drive in the minivan. It's a Chrysler uh, cam. I, I don't know if it's from Belmont or not, but it's a beautiful Chrysler. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's black. I think it's a limited. It's a it's an incredible car. It's very need, fast. You don't need to get into it because it's, it's just not that cool. So there's Wait, so many people's time. It's very fast. fast. I think I had it up to like 96 at one point, dude. I was like, "Whoa, I, got, I better better slow down." But um, I, I'm in the I'm in the minivan though. Um, what was I saying? I just forgot exactly what okay, I was. You said say. a shark or a bear, and I'm like, "I'll go." Oh after. yeah, it yeah. depends on the situation. Now hear me out on that. And and look, ain't no more hockey left. We're gonna have to get to creative. But there's a lot of shit that goes on. Andy and I on the radio every damn day, so we have to talk about stuff. There's a lot of weird stuff. There's bears in, in St. Louis where we're at. They're they're migrating down no, from from the north, and it's very bizarre. And they're they're coming. In. They're all like very, they're all very skinny. They're malnourished. It's real creepy looking. They, that's they, not they, the bears I'm seeing. Well, the bears I see eat plenty. Well, anyway, you asked me about a, encountering a grizzly bear in the middle of the woods or a shark, and depending on where I'm at with the shark, if I'm stuck in the ocean because the U.S. Indianapolis got hit down by the Japanese and no one knew that you were there because you're dropping the bomb off and you got 900 guys jumping in the ocean and they got eaten by sharks. Like that's a different situation. But if I'm three feet of water and a shark comes, I'll bat that fucking thing in, and it might nip at me and I'll bat it out, get out of the, get out of the water. But if I'm in the, the woods with a grizzly, you're motherfucking fuck. What are you going to climb a tree? Go ahead. It will do. What are you going to do? Outrun it? No, I'll outrun a horse. What are you going to do? It's the apex predator. Jump in the water? Oh, it'll jump down and dive down and get you. Well, my, my kids asked me that question when we were uh, uh, playing a game of, I think, this or that. I think it's what it's called, Cam, or something like that. I, I wouldn't know, Andy. Okay. <laughs> I wouldn't know. Well, no, would you rather, they were calling it. Would you rather? So have a head on. Yeah, uh, going in South, South Korea, playing that game. We, no, we had a 13-hour drive, dude, in the minivan. It's a Chrysler. It's black. It's very, very oh, fast. So is that what you do with the kids, though? Would you like, okay, guys, daddy's <laughs> talking now. Would you rather? My son, Ty, he did not fall asleep once, dude. I swear to God, I think he talked the entire 13 hours. I just did not stop talking. Like, the entire time. My my girls all slept. My wife slept. You know, I, I did. It, he just didn't sleep the entire time. So, well, he wants to hang out with his daddy, dude, and that's good that he talks it. Like, I, you want him to be comfortable talking to adults and stuff. I could always tell when I go into rink, Sandy, and the kids that I meet, and they come up to me and they look at me in the eye and they shake my hand and they actually like talk to me. And I'm like, oh, okay, because I remember being. My dad always wanted me to be like that when I was a kid to be able to talk to adults when you're young, mm -hmm. and, and that's good, dude. So he might annoy you, but it's probably for the greater good. In, in reality, you know? Yeah, you got to be able to talk. There's a lot of kids, man. I see these kids all the time on a daily basis. 
they are like scared to have like human interaction. Have I you know. notice that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't hang out with kids that much, to be honest with you. But so Cam, today <laughs> I went on a bike ride, dude, a long bike ride. Uh early morning. The plan was to get up and watch the sunrise, but I couldn't get it, you know, my daughter up in time for that. So I went out and watched the sunrise a little bit about 6 15 today. I Eight- 30 sunset so it's like a late sunset here in south south carolina but we got the bikes out this morning went for a nice bike ride and uh then for a nice bike ride on the beach too you wear, a helmet. Good exercise. You wear a helmet like a nerd going no mountain. no helmet you have jeans on like barack obama did back in the day no wow. but but i could see how biden would fall off his bike well no i shit. mean I, I see these dudes i see these dudes fall <laughs> off their bikes left and right on, andy like that guy Hey man, we've all fallen off our bike when we're fucking six years old. <laughs> you think that's a bad look? What do you think, dude? Come like on. I'm not getting, I'm I'll not getting, you, uh, not get I'm that. not getting I'm, political on it. I just want to know like, that optics okay. are a lot when you're a president, homie. Optics are a lot. Meanwhile, Putin's fucking, you know, jumping in the water and like wrestling sharks and shit. Even though he's goofy looking and he falls over, trips over after he scores eleven goals in Russia. He trips over the fucking thing, and somebody probably got killed because of that in front of everybody. Hey, how does he's that video, up, how does that video get? How does that video get out? What do you mean? Well, how does it get out? The, uh, like the Biden. Like, yeah, the like Biden. there's not like Secret Service well, it, people around there being Andy, like, "Hey, well, hey, everybody." Andy, that's a great question. Why is when he fell? There's a bunch of random people right there helping him. Where's the Secret Service like picking him up? Why isn't anybody like, why is he going ahead of everybody? That's an intersection of people you don't know. You're a president. Like, protect the motherfucker. Like, I, I don't know. I, we don't need to get to, I don't want to. Well, let me just say this. I've been on bikes like that where, you're, where your feet and, are enclosed you know, in like you know, racing you know, pedals. You know. And sometimes you forget, you come to a complete stop and you don't dislodge your foot. You don't take it out. Especially if you have racing sharp bike yeah. shoes on. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, and right. sometimes you just kind of fall over a little bit, and that that does happen. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Mm-hmm. I've seen it happen pretty often. Hey, what do you think of o- of Ovi playing soccer? Look at that man! Look at what he does, dude. <laughs> well, he signs a one day. I don't get it. He signs a one day contract with Domino, Diamond, whatever. He got packed house, probably a hundred thousand people there. He's going a hundred fucking miles an hour. He's going a hundred miles an hour. He looks like he's two fifty. He, he looks, looks like, like he's 300. He looks he like looks, Pavel Sandoval, the baseball player. The big panda. He's 260 pounds, Andy. No, seriously. He's 6'2". He goes 100 miles an hour. And this guy's like, I am a soccer player. I am going to get the ball. No, you're not. No, you're not. Sit your little <laughs> bitch ass down. And I'm glad that he didn't sit there like, oh, my knee. Oh. I'm glad he got up like I'm kind of a man. Whatever. You well, you can't it. say that. You I can't say that. that. No, I'm sorry. I, no, but usually soccer players are like, I'm hurt. It's fine. He got up, and I like that respect. And then Ovi makes a play, gets in the slot. Those guys make a badass moves. The guys are making sick ass plays. And they kick it to Ovi. He left foots the sound bitch. And it goes right in. The dude's like, I can kick that mug again back toward tap and I'm gonna do it. Because I'm gonna have Ovi be a goddamn pimp. Pimping ain't easy. Prostitutes way more difficult in job. Go ahead. Hey, that one dude, because like after Ovi, like I want to break it down because he was almost offside and then he wasn't offside. Right. He got back onside. Uh there's a guy right by the far post. He almost touched the ball. Could you imagine if that guy touched it? Like he'd be living with Brittany Griner right now, dude. If that would have happened. I mean, if he touched it, then it's like okay, it's yeah. over for him. Yeah. If, if uh, Putin, oh, Putin would not put up with that. If well, this guy took the goal away from Ovi, he'd be in. He'd be in a lot of shit. I think that's petty, Andy. To be honest, like there's other things that they would do. If he would have kicked it wide, maybe you can make it an argument. But him tapping it in, Ovi looks sick no matter what. He was the MVP. Sick. He looks Luke, like he's whatever. been eating very, very well. He looks very heavy. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, like he, I look he at him like, I know what that look, looks like. He he's in now. hockey shot. Uh, shape. He's always he got looks- that Russian goofy body type to him, eh? Like, Andy, if you were big, you'd have that body type because you're not like, I don't know. I shouldn't talk right now because I'm heavy because I drink a lot of beer. But, like, he, they, they got that heavy build to him. Like, uh, 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 Emilienko, the badass MMA guy from pride fedor emilienko like he's got that like goofy body but he's an unbelievable athlete and that's how ovi is man he's running 100 miles an hour that wasn't fake chart my guy my uh my teammate on uh the, the uh radio show in the morning he's like eh, i think that was set up i go no it wasn't he was going 100 miles an hour you don't fake that run you know like i bumped into him and he and obi put his 
Put his shoulder down. It looks yeah, sick. but time out. What's he playing in? Is that like an all-star fun yeah, game? I, I don't know. I, I don't know, but it was it looked important. I think it was like every well, no, because the other team when Ovi scored with his left foot, they were like congratulating him and stuff. I think this was like a, He's a like pimp. a chari- like, like a charity game or something. I would I think soccer's still pretty big in, in Russia, but Ovi's the man, dude. And he should be. And you're right when you talk about it on your your show, uh, Hot Mike. You like oh he's gonna he's gonna be a Russian that's gonna have a statue in Washington D.C. Yeah, yes. damn he is, homie. He's gonna be <laughs> the only Russian that has a goddamn mic or a, a statue in D.C. In the nation's capital, this guy's gonna have a statue, as he, should, as he should, Andy. As he should, he does a lot for that town. Everybody loves him. He's always been good to everybody. He he came over here. He, has, he probably has his family over here too. He spends money here, pays taxes. No, yeah, he has a statue. Hey Cam, the employees here at the uh, Omni Oceanfront in uh, Hilton Head Island, yeah, which was founded by William Hilton back in the day. Back in the what, seventeen late seventeen hundred sixteen hundred something. My bad. Yeah, he was yeah. like he was like on a voyage, and then he found this like mm-hmm. island, and and uh, so I, I was actually on the on the William uh, Hilton Highway on the way in, dude. So that makes sense why they would name that after him. The but union got their ass kicked there too, man. South Carolina, they got beat, they got the shit kicked out of them. Yeah, but you the, told me there's like a lot of war history and stuff like that going on here. I, I don't know about all that. Yeah, yeah I don't know about war. all that. Yeah, and Andy, there was, homie. It's pretty, it's pretty cool, man. That whole that a whole lot state, of history dude. here. A lot of history. A lot of Civil War history. Yeah, they got their shit kicked in, and they won back. There's a lot of stuff, man. There's Damn, a lot of stuff. did you know that I was born in South Carolina? True story. Man, that's cool, Andy. Okay, this is I'm in my home state right now. Cool, man. <laughs> so cool. I mean, if you can believe that. Uh, right. Anyway, there's people here who work here, Cam, from all over the country, all over the world, actually, Hungary, uh, oh, Jamaica. Well, Jamaica. The people who work here from Hungary, though, and then there's these one girls who work who are who are here from Slovakia. One of them is can very close something? family friends with Tomas Tatar. Cool. Can I ask you something? Yeah. If what? you were a single guy there, because we all have mm-hmm. our fucking buys list now. What up, homeboys? From Maine to Saskatchewan to Vancouver to Cali to everybody. We all love all y'all. But if the single cats were like, oh, Andy, oh, South Carolina, Andy is cool and things are cool with there. If there were single people and the boys are like, I want to go to South Carolina to sniff around a bit and play with some golf and maybe not oh. spend that much money, can they sniff around a little bit? Is oh, there talent dude. not older? everywhere? Okay, older. Yeah. It's not like an older community. No, I've at seen all. young guys that want to like do their thing. Oh yeah, dude. The golf here is stuff? like world renowned. Like people know that. In fact, I talked about Hilton Head last week, dude. I, I heard from a bunch of our listeners, dude, who were like reaching out, who had either been here and was were giving recommendations or, or heard great things about it. But no, for sure, dude. Okay, absolutely. I'm just asking. I'm just, asking. Yeah. I'm just for the younger yeah. crowd that want to sniff around. Oh. Yeah. Pretty good spot to go. Yeah, they just cute girls around, and they're like, "Hey, what's up?" I'm like, okay, that's kind of cool for them. And it's not Miami where you're like you're competing with big dogs like South Carolina. Like, if you get a cool golf group with you, like, and you find a couple girls, like, it might be easier. I don't know. Yeah, Myrtle Beach is probably a little more okay. Yeah, I heard like that. like redneck maybe, if you oh, will. Yeah. Like, well, I, I don't mean redneck that in a bad way. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm sure there's a lot more of like uh maybe like a spring spring break vibe to it. Yeah. All right, yeah, stay away from that bullshit. Th- this but doesn't get on redneck girls will have fun with you. <laughs> oh yeah. But this this place doesn't necessarily have that. This I is more you. like you know. You. But dude, there's like three big time golf course. Actually, I'm gonna go putt putt, dude. There's like a, a world like international putt putt course, dude. It's yeah. like a, every hole is a par five cam. Apparently, like it's incredible. Like it's like super challenging. Video of it, homie. Take video. I'm going to. I'm going to. You ever you ever played a par five putt putt course? Dude, I haven't played putt putt in years. No, actually. I don't have goddamn kids. No, I haven't. <laughs> I don't go to putt putt shit. I just don't do it. Kate and I are past that fucking point. I ain't dating girls. So why would hey, I go to a putt putt fucking thing? Could you imagine if you had to go back and date? And oh, do that oh, all over again. Oh, they would think I'm look, I'm like a novelty act with girls. Like they want to be around me, but because I'm funny and stuff, and I think that because you're cool and but like I'm like I, I, I don't know what I am. I would be lost. I'm so high maintenance, such a princess. I like I like Kate knows everything about me. Like I kind of need that. 
but yeah, girls would be like one to hang out with you. But I think I'm just like a, I'm just like a shiny object that's funny. And then I'd, mm. I'd go home and be lonely or something, you know. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Oh. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you could. Overweight handle this now. I don't know what to do. <laughs> so no, there's a lot of really good golf courses here though. Yeah. But uh, pickleball has become really, really big. Can I've been asked by a number of people to participate in some pickleball tournaments and stuff like that. Would you have any interest in getting involved with that? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, I need to lose weight. I'll do that. Kramer okay. talked about that. Our boy. Yeah. Some guys always ask me to do everything. That's fine. But I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, okay. All right, let's start doing that. When I get back in town, let's start playing some pickleball and stuff yeah, like okay, that. Fine. I, now okay. we got to play golf. Now I'm like a pickleball guy. Like, hey, the pick one. Oh, pickleball is fun. I'm pick you. one, Andy. I can't do both. <laughs> hey, I got to give a shout out to a few people. I'm watching Colorado last night. Let me just say this about the Avs, man. Like, they they are, like, deserving champions, oh, man. Shit. They're champions that you can sit back and you can say, wow, they yeah. deserve to win the Stanley Cup. I said it earlier in the year. I'm sure I said it on here. I know I said it elsewhere several times. It just felt like from the beginning of the season, this was their year, and this was going to be their year. Yeah. And, you know, they've got Kale McCarr, man. He is – just the 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 his nickname should be the difference maker, man, because nobody Big has nickname, anything <laughs> that can match up with him. Nobody can. He, he's he is so him. different in terms of how he impacts the game. And you know, people bring up is he top three in the in the world? What I, I mean, yeah, I, absolutely. Is he first? I, I don't know. Can you put him ahead of McDavid the way McDavid played in the playoffs? McDavid took his game to the next level. But if we were to do a draft of all NHL players right now, man, he would not slip beyond number two, dude. He's that good. Pop quiz. So he uh, had more playoff points than uh, pretty much everybody else besides three other guys. Who are the other guys? Real quick. Go. Go, Andy. Go. Pop what? quiz. Go. Defenseman? Defenseman. Ever in the, in the history? Point. Wasn't in it the point. most in like no, – Since like most... 85, I think. Since 85. It was the most in like 38 years or something like that. Yeah. Who okay. are the other guys that beat him? Um, Come on. I'd say, well, Bobby Orr. No, no, it's too. He's too late. The current, more oh. current guys. It's eighties and, and up. Paul Coffey. Yep. Come on, um, you know, a guy. Well, no, cool. he ha hold on, Al oh, McInnes. Al McInnes. Yep. One more. Um, because Al McInnes would have done that in like eighty nine, yep. probably. So one other guy. Um, 94. I, I, we can't waste oh, time. And, oh, Brian Leach. Then. What, Brian Leach. Sorry. I didn't mean to have a pop quiz. Sorry. And he got them all. I'm going to give you credit for all three of those. That was kind of <laughs> like a, we usually never do that, but it is what it is. But that's pretty good, man. He's really good. Andy, he's good. That team deserves a win. Fucking EJ. I love you, buddy. Eric Johnson. God, we went through a lot of shit. He went through a lot of shit here. <clears throat> the whole golf goddamn thing with all of us not the Lake of the Ozarks it was embarrassing and brutal. He had a terrible reputation after that. Is just was tough on him. Now he's laughing at everybody, man, and he deserves it. He's a good guy. Yeah, he is a good guy, and he's overcome a lot of injuries there in Colorado too, with the concussions and stuff. He even said last night he wasn't sure if he was going to play. So big shout yeah. out to him. Big shout out to Ray Bennett too. Oh who, God, Andy, who, who chirped your ass on the bench a long no. time ago. And and let me say this: yeah. Eric Johnson, Ray Bennett, two of my favorite people who have come through the Blues over the last you know twenty five years, like just. Obviously, you know, great people. Jared Bednar, too, man. I got to know him a little bit. He was the head coach of the Blues uh, American League team several years back. He's paid his dues. I mean, his I think his family was, like, living in South Carolina, speaking of all the places to live. South Carolina, back when he was uh, coaching in Peoria, dude, he had to spend time away from his family. This guy had to really pay his dues. And who knows? He may not have gotten the, the head coaching job there if – Whatever happened to their coach with Colorado? Remember the coach like stepped down, or Patrick Waugh either stepped down or got fired like right before the season was about to begin. Yeah, and and they had to make a decision. I think Jerry Bednar had just come off an American League championship, whatever he had won an American League championship, and everyone knew he was going to be an NHL coach. But it happened pretty quickly. Goes to Colorado. I mean, they were worst in the league five years ago, man. They truly have built yeah. themselves into a Stanley Cup winner, and that's what happens when you um. When you make some real shrewd moves like Joe Sackick has done, and you're able to draft generational talent, which they've done twice now. So back to Ray Bennett. And sorry, I was like coughing whenever I was talking about EJ. And back to the Eric Johnson thing. Andy, you were with us, you know, not with us in that particular moment, but you you know the shit that he went through, the organization. Oh, yeah. 
like the first pick overall, like you went through hell. Like you're going, you had thirteen thousand people at the game, so like it was bad for a bit. Then you get EJ, then this whole fucking debacle happened. You know, we talked about it, and it just was got off on EJ. Just stuck through it, got traded, injuries, and now he's he's doing his thing. So I just want to like re reinstate. Oh yeah, and you even, you even go back to that draft back of two thousand six. Yeah. Everyone was always comparing him to Jonathan Taves and everything. But you one know, more thing and, about Ray Bennett, though, Andy, and I'm glad you yeah. brought him. He was so good to me, man. I oh, love yeah. Ray Bennett. He was so damn smart. He was so well so smart. He was so uh, and he a couple times he had to yell at me, Andy, a couple things. It just like a couple goofy and, and I I'm like, yeah, I deserve that. Like he was and I did a couple goofy things and I said a couple goofy things to his partner, Andy Murray, in the paper and stuff. Remember an embarrassing moment of mine. And Ray was always just cool about it. And I will never forget that, dude. He was a really good coach, and he deserves this. Ray Bennett, what's up, homeboy? Anyway, an agent. You look good, buddy. He does. He's a good guy. Really good coach. Yeah, real good coach. This guy's been on an NHL bench for like 25 years or whatever it is, and he's never won a Stanley Cup. He was Andy Murray's guy. Then he became Ken Hitchcock's guy, and Hitch totally had the trust of Ray Bennett and uh, and vice versa. And, and then, you know, now he you can tell, man, Jared Bednar, whenever he's talking to an assistant coach on the bench, he's always whispering in the ear of Ray Bennett, man. I mean, yeah. that's, that's like his go-to guy on the bench. So a big shout-out to Ray, his son, Kale, oh, who yeah. played, for the, played for the AAA Blues back in the day. And Ray used to come out, man, and run help, help us run practices and do stuff. Like, so this guy is – he's top shelf, man, for he's sure. He's always going to have a job. He will always have a job, and he's going to make a shit ton of money, and he's going to be a big dog. So anyway mm. – Listen, I'm gonna say something that I don't think is true, but it's a crazy rumor. Okay, ready for it? Because someone just texted me. People are like throwing out this rumor that John Cooper is gonna leave and go coach the Detroit Red Wings, do for Eisenman. Okay. <laughs> okay. So why would you do that? Well, I hear Jeff Halpern is the guy who's getting the job there. His assistant. He's got a couple of assistants. The bomb Lalonde. you just threw out. Like who? Like who uh, told? You? Like that's a bomb you just threw out. Like we're gonna. Post oh yeah. It like hoops well, like, no, no you don't post it like as in like what it just i'm just saying i'm not okay. reporting that that's happening someone's it's it's out there a little bit okay. it's not out there out there but somebody just sent the sent me a text i'll go ahead and repeat it sounds a little ludicrous you wouldn't think that it's going to happen After, but yeah. people yeah. like to put the connection together because eiserman he's the guy who hired coop you know so be good, you know, man. they've got a they've got a connection they've got a relationship man hey in professional sports nothing would ever surprise me anymore you know that i get you i get you on that 100 percent. how about um, poor Corey perry who i like man i've been battling yeah. against him for a long time he's playing for london and shit i like Corey perry man awesome guy the worm little dirty motherfucker i like it though dude i like it better than like a cadre for some reason if like Perry does something dirty, I'm like, ah, that was dirty, but I still like you. Oh, I, yeah. I get you. Where some of these guys, when I do dirty shit, I'm like, ah, I don't get you. Where Perry, I'm like, yeah, dude, you're cool, man. I don't know. They call me whatever, but uh, it is what it is. Maybe because I played against them, but losing three in a row, yeah, I feel for you, buddy. But you already won one. You're a fucking shit kicker. You're good, dude. You're cool. Yeah, I don't I don't have a too big of an issue. I mean, listen, he's lost three straight, but yeah, I know. I just feel fun. He, he, he has won one. I know. Back in 2007, so. With a bad team with the uh, Anaheim Ducks, man. That was a cool is, is he a Hall of Famer to you? Like, did he have to win another one to solidify? I don't, know. I don't even know. Because, like, Daniel he, Alfred said, man, like, Daniel Alfred said, he was just, uh, congratulations to him. Although, he did kick me off of the Ottawa Senators team bus one time at the draft. Well, you look like a goofball in that situation, Andy. You okay. can't go on somebody's bus like that. Like, well, you, Yuri, that, that Yuri, Yuri, what are you doing? Yuri Fisher said, come on our bus. Yeah, but you gotta like know well, what you're doing here and there, you know, like know your surroundings and shit. This is like ten years ago, and the bus was leaving. It's all they're all going to the same place. I didn't see the Ottawa little sign in the front of the bus, but everyone's leaving from the same hotel. Does it really matter? Nobody cared. I, I don't know. No, the guys do care. They don't want some. I, I don't know. Look, I wasn't there. I probably would have laughed at you to be honest. With you. <laughs> but um, I knew what I was. I knew what I was doing. But he yeah. did throw me off. But I don't know. Listen, Daniel Alfredson he had a really good. Really good career. Uh, did he scream Hall of Famer to me? I don't know. No, he's like, listen, more it, it, than any other Swede, right? Like he's up there. I know Backstrom's. He there. was. He had a really good career, man. They loved him in Ottawa. I, I listen. He was a great player for his era. All I'm saying is, like, I if if people like him are getting in, like, when's Alexander Mogilny gonna get in? Like when Mogilny played. 
I like know. to me, he was like a superstar when he was at the the top of his game. Keith Kachuk was like a superstar at the top of his game. AR, Pierre Turgeon. Like we can go. Oh, yeah. list, well, I mean Pierre Turgeon about 1,400 points. Andy. But Kachuk leading the league in goal scoring in like back to back years or whatever it was. You know, and like I don't know. Probably like fighting man. He like he was he was doing a lot of things. You have to tack all that on. Just like a defenseman that's tough, like that that made it, that didn't put the points up. Like you tack everything on. Intimidation to this, that I don't know. I don't know where's Corey Perry's point production at. Where's he at with goals? Where's he at with the uh, he's a former Hart Trophy winner? You know, know. So, he scored 50 goals, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. And, and he's got like that triple club or whatever he is, you know, won a, won a gold and a gold and, and a, a gold. Yep. And, yeah. like he, 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 listen, he's, he's, he's been a great player. Plus, he's been able to like, and then, and then re- by the way, re- oh, yeah, and reestablish like how he plays and, and yep. he just find he finds a way to fit in on winning teams. You know, so hey, what know. happened with Kucherov at the end of that game? Do you see that? Brody, well, that. I didn't know what. Yeah, what well, here, here, here's the deal. Like he, he went back to the bench. He had a broken stick. Yeah. Rarely yeah. do you see this because equipment managers in the NHL cam, as you certainly know, yeah. these yep. guys are so quick. They're so on it. They're focused. 100%. They have to be focused. They can't just be looking in the stands or whatever. He comes back to the bench to get another stick because his stick on the ice broke, and there wasn't a stick there ready for him. He got pissed. Yells at the trainer, or whoever he's yelling at, throws his gloves and just hops over the wall. And you what, know what, what time it, left? All right, 20, 25 seconds, whatever oh, it was, something okay. like that. All right. I don't know. So what do you think of that? I think of like you're worn out with everything. All these guys, man. Like you again, I said this before. You, your schedule's not normal when you're a winner. Everything's like condensed, and you have obligations to do when you're a fucking winner. Everybody wants you, not just in like your organization, but in your hometown. Everybody's like, can, can you do that? Hey, can you, can I have the, can, can, you're a winner. But, but, you just nonstop. You can't get your schedule. They're tired. They're pissed. I don't know how they kept going. No, I got you. But I will say this though. Can, I mean, listen, I, and I'm not saying, I'm not chirping anybody on Tampa Bay. What they've done are, is unbelievable. Yeah. They, you know, had an incredible run and and they're going to be strong contenders coming back next year. Yeah. Okay. They may win it again next year for all we know, goalie, but, man. but I, I know we talk about how many games they played and everything. It's just, it's just the reality of the situation. The season was paused for several months, no travel. They won in the bubble. Okay. Um, different situation last year, shortened season, 56 games, you know, so, yeah, the, right, Andy. I, you, maybe I you, okay, that. Well, you know, I don't know. Nobody else is saying that. I, I'm just saying this is not uh-huh. like you know three consecutive seasons of 82 games where it's the grind yeah. and whatever, and then they the full four rounds. It's it just it's just different. You're right. That's all I'm saying. You're right on that. That's why I have you as a partner. I I keep thinking of like I, maybe I don't even want to think of COVID shit. I can't like put all the math together. You're right. They they probably did have the rest that they needed. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. Like, I don't think you could do that in a normal season where you just go, go. Like, I don't know. Although it's still difficult because you're still doing shit. Dude, it's season. still very difficult. I and I, I, I thought John good. Cooper, his comments after the game he looks were, he looks a little kind of defensive a little bit yeah. about establishing the greatness of the Tampa Bay Lightning and everything they've been through the warrior mentality, the injuries that individual players have. You Listen, we'll that. hear about injuries, man. They're showing the, the foot of, of Val Nachushkin for Colorado. Any team that goes that deep into the playoffs is going to have a room full of warriors and a room full of injured players, man. That's the way yeah. it goes. And yeah. so, listen, nothing's – you can't take anything away from Tampa. But I, I don't think you have to, like, um, you know, remind people uh, how great – of a run this was because I think people truly know. I thought it was interesting that he said, Hey, typically you remember the teams that you win championships with. He'll remember this team, even though they didn't win. I thought that was a very interesting a nice comment, thing. but you, you know, were, so yeah, you know. right now you're going to remember it because they're right in front of you. But whenever you put the pictures on the wall and decades go by and you got guys like me going into a devil's locker room and you look at all the pictures, that's what you remember, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm with you. So anyway, to be so negative there. I'm just like I'm kind of zoning. I'm not trying to be negative at all. I'm just like No, no, zoning. I am. I'm just like zoning. Yeah. I didn't even drink I, today, by the way, just so you know, homeboy. Cam, you I, so- I, okay, I just got my mind right. I got I got my mind right. But I didn't drink any. I was crushing water. 
And now my wife opened a bottle of wine for me when I got home, and I'm chilling. Yeah. Well, I may have to find. I may have to find you for today for what you've done. My wife is pissed on vacation. Money out. I I don't care. Take money out of the next thing. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Barry Barry Trotz. You know, I think he just basically said, "Okay, I've gone visited." I'm still getting paid four million, five million, six million, whatever the hell he's making from the New York Islanders. There's no rush. He's got family obligations, he said, but he also went around and he listened to different teams and whatever. Nothing pulled at his heartstrings, and he wants to take his time. I respect that about Barry Trotz, man. These coaches that are making money anyway and have been doing this for so long, Cam, and the grind is is so intense, dude. Take a year and just oh, hit yeah. the reset button and find that energy once again that well, you get, that you know you need. You can't go in ninety percent when you're a head coach. You got to be all in. You're right, homie. And another thing is like sometimes, like as a coach, you got to sit back and watch the game from a different view and see where it trends and figure out new strategies and see how like you know the momentum changes. And it's just, it's just different every year, man. And so yeah. when you're a coach and you're in the moment, like maybe you miss things. Cause you're not watching everything because you're busy. So sometimes when you get a take a fucking year, go sit in your castle and your goddamn beach and have 50 fuck TVs and have people wait on you, kick your goddamn feet up and take your goddamn notes down yeah. Oh, yeah. and watch yeah. it and let, watch your children play football in the sand. And, eh, come on. Well, he's got oh. some, some family obligations that he has to deal with. Hey, and, Maybe I was a little know, too like He's a, got us, I think it's a, a special needs son and stuff like that. So he's got some family, family obligations and um, and I, I I give him all the respect in the world, man, for just saying, you know what? I'm going to pump the brakes and I'm going to take my time. Paul Maurice, on the other hand, I think that was his intention to just take some time. But, you know, if Miami, Florida starts calling Cam with oh, that team, oh, and, uh, <laughs> he walks right into a Ferrari situation, man. How do you catch that good down? players too, man? Like, fuck, yeah. I'll go to Florida. I'm like, oh, yeah, OK. Let me. Uh, oh, I'm. Well, okay. How close are we to the? Yeah, okay. I'll put this little place on this little inlet with my fucking forty-two foot center console with four four fifties on the back of that my back, of, and I'm gonna have like uh, fishing rods out the wazoo and just get your mind right and watch games on your boat and like I don't know. God damn! I always think of the best of the best. Why wouldn't you want to be in Florida? Do your thing, homie. Yeah, we're gonna have him on very very soon. Actually, just yeah. talked to him the other day. So, congratulations to Paul Maurice. Um, you know, the situation in Winnipeg, Jim Montgomery, is he the favorite? The day that this drops on Tuesday, Tuesday, um, Tuesday, Jim Montgomery is actually interviewing with the Boston Bruins today. Ooh, yeah, like he's such a cool so, cat. So, David Quinn, uh, Jay Leach, um, you know, I play with him in minors. Did you? Yeah, did you think he was going to be a coach? Because I hear people who yeah. played with him, like he just kind of had that, he had that vibe to him, like he yeah, was gonna man. Be a coach. stoic. But he was nice yeah. to me. I was crazy, and he was good to me, and I will never forget that. Little yeah, thing, okay. Andy. I'm a simple yeah. man. Yeah, that's simple good. Man. That's good. So, Jim Montgomery, we'll see what happens. I heard he had uh, interviewed with uh, Chicago, too. I actually heard Steve Ott may have talked to oh, Chicago. I, I <laughs> <laughs> we need him, by the way. I Get know. him on before I, I put know. my foot down on his ass. Yeah. But yeah, Otter could do what he wants. Too. He's going to be able to do what he wants. Well, and he will coach. He's very respected. Throughout yeah, hockey, yeah. I've heard that from some other people. People love Otter and Jim Montgomery. Obviously, it's only a matter of time before he gets another head coaching no. job. So I, w- I would think that'll happen now. Hey, so, I, mean, I do want to pass. Happen would, in the summer? Is that what you're saying? I would think that I wouldn't be surprised. Otter, you think they're all going to be gone for Jim Montgomery, not for Otter, not the hot dog. Listen, the well, first you're step is things, and now I'm like, whoa! Now you got me going. The first you- step for Otter is to start getting some interviews, which apparently okay. he's talked to Chicago. That's good. He's got the respect. I don't see him stepping into a head coaching role as I, soon as this coming season. Jim Montgomery, obviously, listen, this guy was on top of the world. He yeah. was considered a very good head coach. He had some issues he had to deal with. I give the Blues all the credit in the world for stepping in, giving him an opportunity to reestablish his reputation. That's what they've done. Now he's getting interviews. And I would imagine he's going to get very serious uh, consideration. He is already from Winnipeg. Although one other name to pay attention to as well is um, is uh, Vincent Pascal or Pascal really? Vincent. <laughs> this what? is the coach with the, with the, with the Columbus Blue Jackets. Why am I saying no it? Wonder. I'm saying it name both ways. No, I, look, uh, I, I do a lot of things and I study a lot of things, but I, I, yeah. I just don't know his name, homie. 
I don't have all my notes in front of me, dude. I'm on vacation in Hilton Head, dude. I'm just doing this in a ballroom, a very nice ballroom because Cam's 10 hours late. I don't want your wife to be mad at me or Ty or little Ivy. Oh, well, God. <laughs> no, I don't want to be pissed at me, man. I, I don't. I'm hey, so So David Quinn has yeah. interviewed. Um, and so. Hey, is that his Twitter people... account, by the way, that says, hi, everyone. Good morning every day. Is oh, that his Twitter account? Probably, so cool. probably not. Probably not. He was cool. Remember we talked to him? But he I know. Was, that's why I look at his Twitter. Yeah, but, yeah. No, I, I don't know if that was him. But he would love for that. He would love that. You know, Bruins job, obviously being like from that, that area. So, yeah, we'll see what happens with uh, our boy David Quinn and Jim Montgomery, Boston, Winnipeg. Yeah. Hey, I want to throw this out there. I put this out there on Twitter the other day. That you know, a lot of speculation. Edmonton, Toronto, just to name a couple of teams. Billy Huso, who got interest in Billy Huso, but. Hey, pump the brakes. The Blues want to keep them, and they're trying to they're trying to resign them as we speak right now. They're trying to get it done. Dang D dog, Andy. Good job. Yeah. Good work there. Good job on that. Because everybody's like, who's so going here? Who's so going there? I'm like, okay, whatever. Andy went there. And then I was but, but the deal is, though, I mean, who knows if they can get it done? The Blues probably have to be creative, move a contract or two to make it happen. But listen, I think Doug Armstrong and um and uh, Craig Berube, the Blues head coach, just like everybody in the league right now, man. You watch Colorado right now. You see what took place with the Blues. You have to have two good goaltenders. I know, I know people look at it and be like, well, why would you ever want to tie up $10 million into one position? Because that $10 million can get you into the playoffs. It could be, that's the difference between getting in the playoffs and not getting in the playoffs. So well, I know, you know yeah. typically maybe you wouldn't want to do that, Cam. But, you know, you've drafted both of these guys in Bennington and Huso. You've developed both of these guys, you know, um, in terms of, you know, the the amount of time that you've committed to both of these players to getting to this point of where they're at in their career. Uh, I mean, I think it'd be hard to just let him go and go play for somebody else where you know he's going to be a good goaltender. And I will say this about Billy Huso. He really likes St. Louis, and he really likes Jordan Bennington. And he's a cool-ass dude. I told you that several times before, Cam. And it's not in his personality to say, oh, I'm just going to go get the most money I can get, stuff my pockets with as much cash as possible. The grass isn't always greener on the other side. I like where I'm at, and I'd like to stay there. So we'll see if they can make it happen. Well, money's always green, and green does matter. So it depends on, you know, what the offers are. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. I don't know. I, I like him, man. And I know you've always talked highly of him, and uh, they have a good connection with the two guys who are competitive, but not like – you know, a nuisance in the room, which could always affect everybody. They, they got a good thing going. So, uh, yeah. So you think he wants well, to say, everyone's like, it, who's all here? Who's all there? I'm like, okay, okay. Well, but just well, to yeah. an extent, though, Cam, I mean, he's not going to take that much of a discount to stay. Well, I I mean, you can't. You can't. Well, but at the same time, he up. knows the coach likes him. He knows the general manager likes him. He knows he's going to get games. You know, they're, they're both going to play. You don't need to play a guy, you know, 55, 60 yeah, games. If you don't have to. You're right. You know? So anyway, so pay attention. We'll see how that goes. All right, Claude Julian on uh, this edition of the Canvas Strict Podcast. He was your coach. Yeah. When was he your coach? Well, he remembered me too. He yeah. did. He did. And I, I thought I was going to ask him, like Andy, you bet me that he didn't, you wouldn't remember me. But he called me out at the beginning, and I'm like, oh, he does remember me. So mm -hmm. I would have won probably money on that. But, man, yeah. he was good, dude. I, it was a weird situation. I was too young to really – understand what was going on i'm trying to fit in you know how it is i had my own little yeah. world going on but um but him getting fired was very bizarre we were fucking killing everybody but he was always good to me he was very just like chill like here just let's do this I remember yeah. mad dog john madden a couple guys getting weird with him I, I don't know it was a weird situation but he was always good dude you, you always know when a guy doesn't have a connection or he does have a connection even if you don't really remember it you, you just know you have that feeling it always be inside you he was a good dude he was a good coach yeah. So, yeah, we'll see what weird. happens. Okay. Hey, real quick, because Goudreau, who I said has had a zero, he's got a zero percent chance of returning to uh, Calgary, zero percent. And and I'm sure the Flames are talking trade, talking some teams about Matthew Kachuk right now as well. I would just imagine that's happening. Yeah, you know, and that's just they just have to get involved in that. To bring it obviously from Chicago, Forsberg is interesting. I reported months ago that you know around the trade deadline that Nashville was actually looking at potentially moving him at the trade deadline. And Nashville made it sound like that they had a deal, like that they were going to get a deal done. Now they didn't. 
And, you know, you basically let him walk. You don't get anything in return because it doesn't look like he's coming back there. So we'll see what happens. You wonder if David Perron is a free agent, if Nashville all of a sudden goes after Perron. But I will say this as well. The Blues have made it a priority to re-sign David Perron and Billy Huso. Those are their two guys. I don't know where that leaves uh, Nick Letty. We'll have to wait and see how that plays out as well. So, But Forsberg's a hell of a player, man, whoever gets that guy. Yeah. Yeah, he's good, man. How would you rank them? In order of who, of who you would want, Debrinket, Goudreau, or Forsberg? Oh, okay. Debrinket, uh, 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 maybe. Oh, god damn! Rank him, like, dude. I'd say Debrinket because he's he just can I don't know can shoot. I'd say and then probably uh, how old's Goudreau? What are the ages? Are they the same age? Twenty seven. All around the same age, probably. Okay, uh, I'd say Debrinket, Goudreau, and then um, Philippe. You go to Brinkett over over Goudreau. Yeah. Forsberg's a hell of a player though, too, man. man. Sometimes he can good. go a little quiet. I talk. would I would go, yeah, man. To Brinkett, man, he, this guy can score 50 any given year. You just he's got that type talk. of potential. But he's also been really good playing with Patty Kane and stuff. I don't know. We'll see. I, man. I don't know. All right. But some good ass players that are going to be available for uh yep. In free agency. All right, let's get to Claude Julia, man. People will enjoy this. I've got to get back to uh, the room. We've got reservations tonight. Cam, we're having dinner right next to the lighthouse tonight. Oh, send me some. On the water. On the water. Oh, you girl. I'm sorry, dude. Seriously. I didn't mean to be. They are not happy with you, right? If it was just me and my buddies, I would have left. These people pay a lot of money, man. I don't know what to do. It was slow as fuck. Really hey, let me know. Let me know uh, how much I should early. find. How much I should find Cam if anybody wants to uh, yeah. uh, let me know. <laughs> like, what's a what's a good find? Is it five hundred bucks? Is it a thousand bucks? Is it a hundred bucks? They, what they, is it? They understand my sincerity and my. They understand the situation. I think the good old look boys how, do. Look how tan I am, Cam. Look how tan. I can't is. tell. Just, your camera looks goofy. I can't tell. Okay. <laughs> the sun is just beating down on me out here. Tan Maybe mama said. <laughs> All right. Uh, Hair Club and HairClub.com. Go to our landing page, www.HairClub.com slash Cam and Strick. Go there and go there today. Replace, restore, regrow your hair, Cam. You've done a good job with the front. Now it's time to do the back. Uh, okay. Get on. Uh, I'm looking at the camera. Oh, God. Uh. <laughs> uh, HairClub. Dot com baby car shield and car shield.com cam i'm letting you do the right uh the reads here on this edition of the cam and podcast go ahead and tell them about car shield and do it now well they'll save you some money okay and they simplify things remember that time i uh my started you know everybody's saying bye to me and i started and happened and i'm like ah uh, cool and they're like oh you're not that cool and i'm like no i am i have car shield i, I got the dude up the street and he'll fix it for me real quick and he did it so I redeemed myself, but it was very embarrassing at the time. So just put my name in uh, for the Paramount Code, C-A-M, which is quite lovely. It's a good name, really good name. It's short for Cameron, by the way. And I used to tell girls back in the day that my name was Cameron instead of Cam because I thought I was more sophisticated. <laughs> CarShield, CarShield.com, 800-857-857. 2481, baby. Get there and call them today. Get that protection, baby. All right. Bellman and Bellman.com, Cam. Well, there ain't no swinging dicks. No, seriously, though, your wife can go there and uh, be like, I like these, uh, you know, Wranglers or I like I like them yay yicks. And they're like, okay, you want to try one? Hi, I'm normal. Hi, would you like some? Oh, I do. No, I do. Know. Great guy. Yeah, he's a good guy. Would you, would you like a water? I'm a normal person. No, I didn't play against your husband in high school, and I beat him up, and I, me, 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 and I took his No, 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 you didn't. No, you didn't. Stop saying that. Can't you just go buy a car, creepo? Anyway, none of that there. We love Bellman. A lot to choose from. Mm. Bellman and Bellman.com, baby. Zero Carb Life Pizza Cam. That's L-Y-F-E. Zero Carb Life.com. Uh, tell them about the pizza, dude. That chicken crust, man. 72 grams of protein. Well, I'm not just protein, up. they got the protein too. And that 12, uh, that uh, 12 inch baby. If you like good pizza and to lose weight, it's a great combo. I have trouble with fitting in the pants throughout the day. And uh, if I'm on that like pizza diet, you know, and I substitute that for like regular pizza, then I can fit in my clothes and I feel like more energetic. And that's a good thing. And it tastes great. Oh, there you go. And it's guilt-free. 
And it's like part of your workout routine. You go work out, then you go have the pizza. Zero carb life, baby. Eat it today. L Y F E. Lose weight, have fun, and uh, enjoy your pizza at the same time. They got two different types uh, beef crumble cam, as well as a buffalo style. So there's a couple different options yeah, for you yeah. to choose from. You can make your own pizza by just getting the pizza crust. And uh, use that co- uh, promo code Cam and Strick, baby. You're gonna save some money on that checkout. Don't forget to hit them up with that promo code Cam and Strick. Um, Waggle Golf, man. Listen, that's a new sponsor of ours. We'll tell you about that as we move along. Get your waggle on, Cam. These golf shirts are unbelievable. You could have used one for today. We've got so much coming out about Waggle Golf. Just check out their website. Get your waggle on. We just made the announcement on Instagram. We're excited about having our friends from Waggle Golf. W a g g l e. Join us and be with us right now here on the Camistry Podcast. So welcome aboard all of our friends from Waggle Golf. And, of course, Mars Blade Cam. This would be a perfect spot here in Hilton Head, South Carolina, to just get out there and start rollerblading, man, and start uh, toe dragging. Toe drag them cougars. That's what I do. All you got to do is get that, like, biscuit puck, you know? Take your shirt off and get your grind on. Put the put the blades on and just cruise around. And when them cougars cruise around, just toe drag them. And they're like, oh, my God. Who was that? Oh my God. Who, wh- where does he live? Oh my God. He's toe dragging me. I love him. That's pretty cool. Start doing that. Although, don't toe pick in front of him because if you toe pick with no shirt on, you're going to fall and they're going to be like, oh, are you okay? And you're going to look like a jackass. That'd so be embarrassing. Toe-tick. So, Andy, yeah. you can't do it. Okay. Mars play, baby. Get those rollerblades and get them today. All right, let's get to Claude Julian. Stanley Cup winner with the Boston Bruins, coached in New Jersey, coached in Montreal. Very, very, very nice guy. Also had a scary, scary incident yeah, at the nice. Olympics coaching for Hockey Canada. Are you kidding me? Know. Listen to this story. Enjoy Claude Julian on the Cam and Strick podcast, baby. The Cam and Strick podcast is brought to you by Car Shield. You know, nothing more frustrating, Cam, than when that engine light comes on. And you know, right off the bat, you're going to have to spend thousands oh. of dollars <gasps> to repair your vehicle. Call 800-857-2481. Mention the promo code CAM mm. or visit carshield.com and use the code CAM to save 10%. Yeah. That's carshield.com. A deductible may apply. Save yourself money. Cam. Sign up and get your coverage now Cam. with carshield.com. Cam. Now to the Cam. interview. Hello. Claude. Claude. <laughs> Hi guys! Welcome hey, into the show. Hey, um, where are you at right now? Are you in uh, up in Canada? Yeah, are you in you Boston? At? Yeah, I'm in. No, I'm actually in Ottawa. Ottawa. So we moved back to Ottawa last year and uh, settled down where our families are both from. So uh, that's where we're at right now. We should start that rumor. Actually, no. We like DJ Smith. <laughs> actually, DJ yeah. did the show. We yeah. like DJ a lot. Windsor boy. He is a Windsor boy. Yeah. Hey, yeah we- that- I got to work with DJ, so uh, you guys don't want to get him in trouble, right? So no, far we get no. along. Listen, people maybe haven't heard from you in quite a while, obviously. Um, you know, you were last coaching with Montreal. You've had a long career, and a lot of things have happened over yes. the course of your career. It says you got a very interesting career, Claude, as well. Cam may call you Claude. I'm going to call you yeah. Claude because that's the proper way to say it. Claude Lemieux told us that. But how are you doing now? What have you been up to? Well, just actually been quite busy doing the family stuff that I hadn't had a chance to do in about 20 years. So this has been great. Uh, last winter, my daughter played competitive hockey here in Ottawa, so got to follow her around. And uh, I've got some younger kids uh, as well, so they, uh, they're they in different sports. And uh, we've uh, kind of been doing the family stuff right now, but uh, obviously uh, been busy also with uh, Team Canada, did the... Uh, the tournament channel one cup mid December in, uh, in Russia. And then, uh, came back, uh, we were in Switzerland for training camp before we went to Beijing for the Olympics. And, uh, as you know, I just came back from the world championships in Finland a couple of weeks ago. So, uh, I'd say since December been quite busy, uh, doing some hockey uh, work that, uh, wasn't anticipating, but uh, enjoy doing. Okay, what was going on in Russia? What was yeah. that like over there? Was it were, were, were things calm, well, or was it like was that, pre, was, was that yeah. pre the war, or what? Well, you know what? It's funny that you say that because we were there. We were guaranteed everything was going to be good and safe, and uh, and it was. But you could tell something was brewing, and uh, you know we were kept in the loop from uh, obviously uh, uh, the people here in Canada that were on top of things, and uh, they said it was safe to go. Uh, we had a great tournament there. We just played Finland, Sweden, and Russia. It was kind of a 
for us, it was to evaluate some players that we're anticipating for our Olympic team. Uh, with the guys that were playing in the KHL, we created a team. And then we were supposed to, from there, go to Switzerland, to Davos, for the Spengler Cup and have a, a different group of guys that we could evaluate there as well. But uh, we had to leave uh, Russia and not go to Switzerland because of, uh, obviously, the pandemic had uh, started picking up in uh, Switzerland. And uh, eventually the tournament ended up being cancelled anyway. So uh, we ended up going back to Davos, like I said, in uh, in January for uh, about a 10-day training camp before heading over to Beijing. So we did end up going back, but uh, we didn't get a chance to evaluate the players that we want to evaluate there. Yeah, it's so difficult traveling and stuff. I mean, the past couple of years have been crazy. But whenever you do have like uh, something like that going on, Claude, and you hear that you're going to Switzerland, you're like, yeah, okay, sure, I'll go to Switzerland, <laughs> the most beautiful country in the world. Absolutely. Like, I was looking forward to Spengler, and the Spengler – is played you know at Christmas time you know so between Christmas and New Year so uh, the players the families everything join us there so there was supposed to be two three hundred Canadians uh, all related to the to the team uh, coming down for that so it was quite the uh, quite the setup and everybody was excited about it we we're going to spend Christmas there and uh, all of a sudden it just got cancelled so a little disappointing but uh, again uh, you know we, there's been a lot of people disappointed with the uh, COVID and. Uh, a lot of stuff been going on, so we've learned to adapt. That's one thing I can tell you. Damn right, Claude, you've been everywhere. I mean, I hope you're I hope you're collecting those miles. By yeah. the way, I mean, you go to Beijing, China. Hey, what happened with your ribs or whatever? You broke your ribs there, like right before the tournament started. How'd that happen? Well, <laughs> it's quite quite the story. We <laughs> kind of downplayed it to be downplayed it a little bit because we didn't want to make it a, the focus. But uh, we had a team building event. Uh, uh, guys were still coming in at different times from different leagues. And uh, so it was uh, going and uh, sledding down a, a mountain. And uh, so anyways, uh, ended up going down there. It had been warm the whole week. Uh, snow was melting. Uh, there hadn't been that much snow, believe it or not, for that time of year. So no snow banks. Uh, and uh, basically uh, hit a patch of ice, uh, tried to stop before a curve and uh, couldn't. And uh, just went over the, the, the cliff, the side of the, the edge of it, and uh, ended up hitting a tree. Oh, so, uh, yeah, so I, I actually got lucky uh, in a sense because it uh, could have been a lot worse. But I did break my ribs, punctured my lung, and uh, had a hematoma on the side of my leg. Uh, and uh, so basically I found out later on that a couple other players had actually – had the same thing happen, but they were a little quicker than I was. They were able to jump off the uh, the sled before uh, it went over the edge. So the sled made it over the edge, but they didn't. Uh, when it came to my turn, uh, I went with it. So uh, probably not probably not as quick or as, as swift as those guys are now. But uh, anyways, that was our team building activity that turned out to be uh, almost a nightmare for me. But uh, I was at least able to heal quick enough to, to make a – to come back and uh, join the team at the Olympics uh, after the first game. Of all the shit that you've done, Claude, playing and all that, and you get into a sledding accident and you break your ribs, and I mean, that is that the biggest injury you've had? Oh, I, I'd have to think so because at one point there, uh, when I went over that cliff, I'm going to be honest with you, I just shut, closed my eyes because oh. I had no idea what was going to happen from there. And uh, sure enough, uh, believe it or not, hitting the tree that broke my ribs actually probably uh, yeah. uh, helped me a lot because uh, that cliff had another 100 feet downwards and the tree stopped me and I uh, was able to climb back up uh, after getting a little bit of help there from uh, some of my coaches. But it was uh, probably one of the worst injuries I've had. And uh, again, you know, when you've been through a lot of stuff, you say, really, this has to happen now. Oh, so my was, God. Uh, why is there a cliff? Wait a minute. How, yeah. how, how big was yeah. like? Can you describe the cliff? Like you're on the cliff. How how big of a drop off was it? Like between that and the tree? I know you said you could have gone another hundred feet or whatever if the tree wasn't yeah. there. How yeah. much distance between the drop of the cliff and the tree? Yeah. Well, like I said, that there was another hundred feet at least. Uh, this the whole uh, drop was uh, probably about 150 mm. uh, feet down. And uh, so, like I said, the guys just let their sleds go when they went down the cliff, and that was it. And uh, they, they just left it there and uh, walked the rest of the way down. But uh, I, like I said, I was lucky to hit that tree, which stopped me from going down further. And uh, so, like I said, it could have been a lot worse. 
Uh, sometimes they say you have nine lives. As you know, I had the tenth put in a few years back during the uh, during the playoffs in the bubble. So there's a uh, one life. I got another uh, life there in that in that accident. So they say cats have nine lives. I hope I'm a cat. Hey, what's a hematoma? Cam, Cam, Cam's yeah. wondering yeah. what a hematoma is. I kind of know what it is. But... <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's really, it's kind of a deep bone bruise uh, that keeps uh, uh, bleeding all the time. So the side of my leg had a real big pocket of blood, and they kept draining it uh, for probably two weeks. Uh, kept draining blood out, and that's probably the one that, believe it or not, took the longest uh, because I had surgery on my broken rib. They... Uh, brought me in uh, and they put a steel plate where the rib was broken because it was pointing inwards and that's what punctured my lung. But that was dealt with pretty quick. And then uh, the hematoma, just even when I was in Beijing there, the doctor kept training it almost on a daily basis, uh, getting the blood out. So everything's good now. I'm totally healed and, uh, and uh, a better man for it. Yeah, no more sledding way. for you. No more sl- Hey, stay off that sled. Stay off of it, Claude. Claude. Come on now. And he's in China, by the way. Oh and no sledding in China. Well, yeah, no sledding in China. <laughs> I get locked up. Don't be well, doing I that. Say, I, actually, I actually told the people that organized that I said, uh, do I really have to go sled? And I said, uh, as coaches, we got a little bit of work we'd like to catch up on. And uh, we were encouraged to go because it was, you know, obviously a lot of players had just come in and uh, were encouraged to go to create that team building concept. So I kind of said yes. And uh, so needless to say, uh, the person who told me uh, I should consider going felt really bad, and uh, but it's just uh, it's part of life, right? Things happen for a reason, and uh, you move on. <laughs> so, how stressful is coaching? Like, I'm curious, man. Like, you, you you coach for a living. You're in Montreal, where where nobody pays attention at all to yeah, the hockey know. team at all, and I, they, <laughs> they, they don't even know what's going on. You might as well, you know, it's like Arizona, but you're coaching, and it's just like it's your life. It's it's every single day, and then all of a sudden. You're not coaching. Is there like a relief? I mean, how much weight is off your shoulders when you just, you know, get to kick back and enjoy life a little bit? Well, you know what? You do this job for the passion more than anything else, because if you were doing it to, uh, just to, to do it, uh, there's no doubt the stress would get to you. But it's a passion. And uh, what I was able to, I guess, understand better this last year is how much pressure uh, was put on us all the time because you don't realize it as much when you're in the action middle of things and uh, you kind of go about your daily stuff and you plug away and you find solutions and you prepare and you do all that stuff. It's when you're not doing it anymore and then you look from the outside and see what's happening. I think that's where you realize how much pressure there is and the stress level that is being put on you. And I think, to be honest, guys, I think it's going to get worse here as we go along because I look at what's going on with the NHL today with 32 teams now, only half of them make the playoffs. Mm. So you know that there's half of the organizations that are disappointed. They're not happy. Uh, The guys that get beat out in the first round, there's another eight teams. That's 24 teams out of 32 where I think a lot of pressure is being put on coaches. And you can see that now with all the changes happening. There's at least, what, six changes that have already been made and uh, there's some during the season that are happening as well so I just think there's going to be more and more pressure being put on coaches as we move forward here so uh, but at the end of the day would I do it again absolutely why because passion takes over all of that stuff you know we're, we're willing to put up with that because we love the game so much I just enjoy coming in every day dealing with players trying to find solutions and you really focus on the things that are important and uh, you try and push away the, uh, I guess, the negative stuff, the expectations and, and uh, you know, the fan base, the comments and the Twitter accounts and all that stuff that are out there. And, uh, you know, you, you kind of got to really push that noise aside as best you can. I don't care what anybody says. Uh, I don't pay attention to it. Uh, some may not pay much attention to it, but you're still made aware of it. It's out there and, and you know about it. Yeah, and your family knows and everything. Yeah. Like, like coaching in Canada, I know you're Canadian. Um, you know, you're from, you know, at least, you know, somewhere, you know, close to the area, whatever. You say you're home now in Ottawa and whatever, but you're bilingual. You speak yeah. French, you speak English as well, both fluently. 
But just in, in, in terms of coaching uh, an iconic franchise like that, like there's got to be so much joy that comes with it because it's like a chance of a lifetime. Not many people get that opportunity. But at the at the same time, I mean, there's just there's there, there's so much stress as we as we put it, man, that comes with the job up in Canada. Could you do that again? Oh, I, I think so. I think the biggest thing right now, guys, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, is how you handle it. You know, I know that there's been coaches in the past that really paid a lot of attention to what was being said around them, and it kind of really takes uh, its toll. And uh, the best thing, and I still remember my first time in Montreal, which was in 2003. Back in those days, our media guy used to bring uh, pamphlets of, of all the things that were written in the newspaper, thinking we needed to know uh, what, was, what was happening in order to deal with them. And I remember, even as a rookie coach, I just said, listen, I don't want this stuff on my desk anymore. I said, all I need to know is what's the flavor of the day with the media so I can at least, you know, have a little bit of preparation in, in my answers. But other than that, I don't care what, what else is being said out there. I need to focus on what needs to be done. And I think that really helped me a lot. And it really helped take a lot of pressure away and uh, stayed away from it as much as I could. Uh, that was the key. Uh, but you're right in Canada, like Montreal, Toronto, even Vancouver, places where, uh, there's a lot, a lot of pressure on the, on the coaching staff, on the GMs, and obviously on the organizations as well. But you know what? Those are really passionate cities that care so much about their team uh, that as a person going in there, you, you should be proud and you should be happy to have an opportunity to work there because if things are going in the right direction, there's no better place to be. Yeah, so you would, you would kind of have like a, a pre-meeting and be like, okay, What's going on? What are they talking about? What's so-and-so talking about? Because there's always one or two guys that are always <laughs> going to dig at you. And so you'd have that meeting, get prepared, and go up there, kind of like a, you know, a press secretary would do. Yeah, it, exactly. Exactly. That's what I would end up doing. I didn't want to know anything else. I didn't you know just to, for the most part, you know, they're going to say, well, today they're going to talk about uh, Carey Price coming back. So, you know, be prepared for those questions or they asked, there was a couple of comments made about, uh, you know, this guy here uh, not getting a lot of ice time. So you may, you may be asked about that. So just kind of a little heads up on different things. The rest, you know, is just basically, you know, deal with the, with the questions that are being asked. And uh, for the most part, you, you know, even as a coach, the one thing I always said is that these guys have a job to do, you know, and you have to respect that. And the best thing I can do for them is to give them something that they can le at least write about. You know, if you don't give them any answers, you don't give them anything, you're making their job tough. And then you wonder why they may be tough on you. So I think it's important to, to kind of work together uh, to, to a certain extent to try and help them do their job uh, as best as they can. And uh, you can supply them with the, some information that will help them do that. All right, how would you get into coaching? Like, well, where, where was the inspiration behind that? Like, who helped you get into it? Oh my goodness, it, it's such a, a, a long story, but I'll make it short. Uh, let me put it this way, it's by accident, because after I retired as a player, uh, that was not necessarily my goal. Uh, I got approached at one point from, uh, it was Pierre Dorion's father, who was a head scout for the Toronto Maple Leafs, had actually asked me if I'd be interested in being the player assistant coach in the minor league uh, system, which was St. John's. Newfoundland, Toronto Maple Leafs had their farm team there. Uh, long story short, Joel Quinville was there with Mark Crawford, and Joel was supposed to head somewhere as a head coach. Didn't pan out, so it ended up uh, he ended up staying. So his uh, son, Pierre, who's now the GM in Ottawa, uh, was told by his father to try and approach me to coach the Ottawa Junior Senators, uh, the Tier 2 Junior A team here in town. So uh, at first I was kind of reluctant, but then you know, I went to camp and uh, did it and just for some reason just kind of felt comfortable and uh, felt like, you know, it was a, something I'd like to do and I just pursued it. We had a, a, an unbelievable year for a young team and then the next year I was approached to join the, the Hall Olympics of the uh, Quebec Major Junior Hockey League as, as an assistant coach and eventually became head coach. So uh, believe it or not, it's not something I pursued. It's something I got uh, asked to do and uh, ended up being the best, best thing I ever did. 
Yeah, you, you, you talk about coaching in Hall, and you won a Memorial Cup that year. And, you know, people that don't know, which, you know, we're in St. Louis, there's some people that don't know about the CHL. But that's a that's a very difficult trophy to win. I mean, you got to go through four rounds, and then you got to play in a different tournament like three weeks later. It's, 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 it's very bizarre, but it's very fun. But who was on that team? And, like, uh, explain, like, how, how, what, what's the difference between coaching those junior kids and then coaching guys that are making a lot of money? Well, Cam, you'll like this one because uh, an old teammate of yours, uh, Colin White, was on the team oh, that my year. Boy. Whitey. God, yeah. I love him. <laughs> Such a great yeah, guy. Yeah, we had Martin Bureau oh, yeah. as well. And, and believe it or not, Marty ended up being our backup that year. Uh, we had a, a kid, that uh, Christian Bronsard, who uh, played in the minors for, for a little bit came out of high school and for whatever reason just took took over but uh, we had peter Worrell oh. at the time as well you know and uh, there's a a lot of these guys had you know kind of semi-successful careers in the minors uh, uh don mclean uh uh there was i'm trying to think and christian dubay was the first rounder for the rangers uh was with our team at the time uh, pavel rosa was a second round pick for the uh L.A. Kings at the time. So we had a decent, uh, Dakota was, I think, a first-round pick to uh, Edmonton Oilers. So we had, a, like, again, a decent team. Uh, can't say a ton of them uh, became, uh, you know, full-time NHLers. So, you know, besides Martin that I mentioned, Colin, and uh, obviously Peter Worrell. But uh, we had a really good hockey club. And uh, as you mentioned, a hard trophy to win because, you know, we not only do you win your league, but then you got to play the champions of the Ontario and Western Hockey League as well. And uh, we had to go through these uh, teams also. And uh, it was a quite, it was my first year as head coach. So it was a, a great way to start. Yeah, no question about that. And I looked at the roster earlier today. You're right. I mean, they didn't, you didn't have a ton of like yeah. superstars, but you had a goaltender, obviously. And, and, and that helps. And you mentioned Peter Worrell and some you other guys. You had Colin then, White so. crushing yeah. guys, probably <laughs> scaring the hell out of everybody. Yeah. My God. Well, the one thing we were, and Cam, it's too bad you weren't with us because we had a real tough team. Oh. The Colin White, the Eric No, We had so many guys that could handle themselves. And I remember playing Lethbridge. And uh, at one point they tried to, rattle us a little bit that way when we were able to respond but uh yeah i really liked our team we had good balance and uh in all i guess positions and also all situations we could play it any way you wanted yeah bring it on and you know what if you want to talk uh smack we'll have a uh, six foot seven uh big pete borelko out there and uh, and bag you up i mean he must have been one of the most intimidating guys in that <laughs> league oh he was yeah by by, the, by his last year there was nobody that came close to him and uh as a, as a young player, as a 17-year-old, he ended up having to take on uh, George Larac, who was in his last year of junior. So he's a 19-year-old against 17. And uh, believe it or not, he held his own. You know, obviously, George was a much stronger, more experienced fighter, but uh, Peter did well. So we had some, uh, had some good guys to practice against as, uh, as he was coming up. You know, listen, I, I got to ask you this, because, you know, shortly thereafter, obviously, you get to the NHL. But, you know, you, you, you made a name for yourself in New Jersey for sure. People knew who you were already. And you're having this unbelievable season. You guys are in first place. Oh, yeah. Three games to go in the regular season. And you find out you're being let go. Now, this, this, this may never happen again in the history of the National Hockey League to have a team in that position and to have a coach get fired that late in the season when you're in first place. Uh, break it down for us, Claude. Like, how would you find out? What did he tell you? And were you in, like, complete shock? Because I can't imagine you were expecting that, were you? No, I, I wasn't. And, uh, you know, it was just one of those situations where, you know, we had just won, I think, four in a row. And uh, the day before, we'd beat the Boston Bruins 4 nothing, And uh, so there was about three, I think, three games left, if I'm correct. And uh, so I came in to work early Monday morning because we had played the Sunday afternoon against Boston. And uh, so I came in, and then uh, I got a call from Lou. And I uh, wanted to meet, meet him up in his office. So I just figured that, the, and Ken would know this, I just figured that Lou wanted me to go up there and he was going to explain to me how, you know, things are done in the playoffs with the New Jersey Devils. It was my first year there and, and uh, you know, how they usually ran things. So I was going up there, I guess, with that in mind. Uh, and then when I got up there, uh, and then Lou said uh, he felt that uh, he needed to make a change and, you know, in, in reflecting back, I know that uh, Lou had done that with uh, Robbie Fatorik and uh, and uh, Larry Robinson had gone in there with 10 games left and they won the Cup. And uh, 
you know, I don't know if it was, you know, again, I, I can't answer for Lou, but I just kind of suspect maybe he thought a, a shock uh, to the system of the team would, uh, would maybe be beneficial. I have no idea, but he just uh, he felt that the change needed to be made. So I was actually shocked. I wasn't expecting it and uh, obviously disappointed because, you know, we we're first place. I think we had 103 points or something at the, at the time. And when you win four in a row, you think your team's going in the right direction. <laughs> anyway, it was one of those things. And, uh, you know, Lou has his way of doing things. And uh, I'm going to say it openly and I'm going to be extremely honest. Uh, Lou is a great guy. And I love Lou. I respect Lou uh, enormously. Uh, and, and Cam will uh, attest that as well. He's an unbelievable person. Uh, when it comes to business, uh, he's tough. Okay. But uh, when it comes to the personal part of the business and the, the relationships, uh, you can't ask for a better guy. And I know that even to this day, I could call Lou if I was in trouble or had some issues or needed help. He'd be right there to help me out. So that's that's Lou in a, in a nutshell. But uh, at the same time, uh, when it comes to business, uh, things are tough oh, with him. Very, very much so. You're absolutely right. I can call Lou right now. He'll answer his phone, even if he's busy. That's the way he is. And, of course, I, I, I absolutely love that, man. He gave me a chance. and But anytime Lou calls you up to the office, <laughs> it's usually never good. Claude, I would dream about nightmares about him calling me in the office. It's usually yeah. never a good thing. We actually did have Jason Arnott on. We've had Lou on, by the way. We've had everybody on. But, like, Jason Arnott had, you know, he was talking about Robbie Fatora kicking out Larry Robinson in the locker room. So I could see where there's some, like, disconnect there. But I remember playing, I just, everything was great. Like, everybody was happy. We're kicking ass. Like, the we had an you know, older team. You know, practices were great. I, I just, it was very confusing as a young kid being in that locker room and having that all go down. Yeah. Well, again, like, I don't know what, you know, how the guys felt. You know, when, when I was let go, uh, I know Lou canceled the practice that day. So I had no idea. Like, I, you know, I've, I had lots of guys obviously reach out to me and, the, you know, the Giantas of this world. And the, and even, the, um, my gosh, Cam, help me out there with our backup goaltender at the time. Was Scotty Coleman uh, or was it? Uh... Scotty. It was Scotty. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Scotty was such a good kid. And, you know, Scotty barely played. I think he played three games or something. And he reached out to me and, uh, you know, uh, expressed his uh, disappointment and what was uh, happening and stuff like that. So at least I felt, you know, like with all of that, that for the most part, the, the, you know, the guys uh, seem to have enough uh, respect for me to, to to call me up or leave me a message or text me. And uh, so that was important for me because, uh, you know, I thought I'd done a decent job. And, uh, you know, we were, like I said, we we're going uh, along pretty well. But, uh, you know, that's, that's the business of hockey. And, uh, you know, GMs have to make tough decisions. You don't always have to agree with them, but you have to respect them. They don't do them for the wrong reasons. So you, if you understand that part of hockey, you're able to move on. And, you know, so I moved on. And uh, shortly after that, you know, within a week, I had a call from uh, from Boston uh, to see if I had interest in going there. And uh, the ironic part about it, and I can tell you guys that now, is uh, after I had just agreed to a contract with uh, New Jersey uh, with Lou, uh, I'm telling you, I signed it. I faxed it back to Lou. It was no more than half an hour later I got a call uh, from the NHL saying that Peter Shrelly uh, would like to talk to me. And if you guys remember, Peter was still with Ottawa, and Ottawa wouldn't give Peter permission to start working with Boss until after the draft. So everything he did, he had to go through the NHL uh, channels first. But anyways... Uh, Peter had asked me if I'd be interested in the Boston job. And uh, as you know, Cam, Lou was very secretive. He didn't want anything leaking out. And we were going to announce the uh, my hiring in a couple of weeks. So uh, I just said, well, let me think about it, Peter. And I hung up and I called Lou and I gave Lou the heads up. And I said, listen, I'm getting approached by that. So next day, Lou had me fly into Jersey. We made the announcement. And Lou, uh, as you know, classy when it comes to that kind of stuff made sure I called Peter before the announcement to let him know that, uh, you know, I was, they're getting ready to announce me uh, signing with him. But uh, so all that to say, the minute I got to let go by New Jersey, I got the call again from, from Peter to go to Boston and uh, spent 10 great years there and uh, with the Bruins organization. Yeah. It always works out. I mean, people. well, you, you had to, it's like, it's not your typical firing. 
and I know you say that's the business side, but it's it's very rare. I mean, was, you, you, you just don't see that happen very often. But at the same time, you're in a great spot in terms of the team winning. I'm sure in the back of your mind, you felt like maybe you'd be in a good position to get another job. I was going to ask you if you had talked to Lula Amarillo after that, like what your emotions were, like because I'm 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 curious, and I think a lot of people would be, Claude. Like, how do you get over something like that when you put so much into a season, you're having success? How do you get over the anger? Like, how does that not carry with you? And I, I guess it helps when another team calls. But I'm talking about initially, how do you deal with that? Well, I'll tell you what made me real nervous about that firing is that, you know, throughout my whole coaching career, I'd never been fired. I kept moving up from Tier 2 to, you know, Major Junior A to American League and into the NHL. And I got fired by Montreal uh, parts of whatever four seasons, you know, there was a lockout and half a season here, half season there. But anyways, I get let go by Montreal. I get hired by New Jersey. And a year later, I'm fired again. So it was two firings in the NHL within a year. So that really made me nervous because I I thought, the first thing I thought is people are going to start thinking there's got to be a red flag there. And, uh, and I didn't know whether I'd ever get another job in the NHL. But when Boston came calling, uh, no doubt, a week, a week after, so I didn't have to procrastinate or worry for too long, uh, that kind of made me feel a lot more comfortable. So... Uh, no doubt uh, that kind of worried me. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, going to Boston was the best thing that ever happened to me. I had a great relationship with Peter. Uh, the way he worked uh, and the way I wanted to work uh, just went uh, hand in hand. Uh, our whole staff downstairs like had a great relationship with the equipment guys and medical guys. We had a really good group of people, which as you know, a great group of players as well to, the Sheras, the Bergerons, uh, we had directly, you know, we had really good leadership. So a uh, really close-knit group that won the Stanley Cup eventually, uh, but uh, had some great years there. And like you said, things happened for a reason. And, uh, it ended up turning out to, to be a, a good firing at the end because, I, like I said, 10 great years in Boston uh, as an NHL coach, can't ask for more. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's amazing how it works out. And Peter Shirelli now, he's now working under Doug Armstrong. He's here in St. Louis working for the Blues. So um, and there's so many different directions we can go in uh, from your time in Boston and obviously winning a Stanley Cup. But you, you had some, some, I mean, personalities there too that you had to deal with. And I'm curious, you know, Brad Marchand, as a young kid, he comes in and obviously he's from the Quebec League. So I'm sure you had some, you know, um, you know, people that you knew that, that you could get some information in terms of who he was and what makes him go and, and his personality and all that. But what were your initial impressions? And was, was he difficult to handle at all as a young player, or did he just come in ready to win and ready to play? Well, there's a lot of stages to go through with him. And number one is that he came out of juniors. Last year, junior, uh, I don't know if you guys know that, but he was even a healthy scratch in the playoffs. Uh, it was kind of like a... a, a a bit of a, I don't know if I can say it on air, but a bit of a shit disturber. You can say whatever you uh, want. Say whatever you the hell say you, whatever want. The yeah. you want, Cloud. This is the cleanest <laughs> Cam's been since we've done this, <laughs> by know. the way. <laughs> there we go. But, uh, you know, even in, in his own locker room, and uh, so there was some issues there, and they made him a healthy scratch. And uh, so I know the year before, and I wasn't there yet, uh, he had gotten cut from the Bruins and uh, publicly complained that he should have made the team and uh, all that stuff. So, uh when he came in that year uh, that I got to Boston, Peter sat down with him and uh, basically told him, uh, anything comes out of your mouth or any trouble starts with you, not only will you be going straight to Providence, but you'll be going to East Coast League. Mm-hmm. So he had been warned. Uh, so uh, anyway, he ended up going to Providence, and we called him up a couple of times that first year. Uh, his second year was the year we won the Cup. Uh, talk about the guy who evolved, and I think, you know, there, there's a lot of credit to be spread around with, with that. And some of it goes to him. But, you know, he's a character player. When you look at him, you, everybody hates him, but everybody would love to have him on their team. And when he played at the World Cup in Toronto with Team Canada, all the people that hated him, that played against him, uh, loved him by the end of that tournament uh, as a teammate. But he's one of those guys that uh, has really, really matured in becoming a good player because of how he prepares uh, when it comes to practice, he's loose uh, in the dressing room and all that stuff, jokes around, makes 
people laugh. Uh, on game day, he comes to the game. Uh, he's in his own little bubble. He's stretching. He's preparing. He's serious. Like he, he, it's, it's just like night and day. And he's very focused and really shows a lot of, uh, I guess, leadership and maturity. At the same time, his first year, I don't know how many times he was in my office, uh, either to discipline him for you know, stupid things he did on the ice, or to warn him about not doing stupid things against a team we're about to play. Because you kind of knew on the other side what could happen. I, I'm telling you, if I didn't have 20 to 25 meetings with that kid, I didn't have one at all. But the other part of credit goes to his teammates, like the Burgies, the Cheras, the Reckies, those kind of guys. They would grab him at times and have to have a chat with him or settle him down. But also he was able to look at those guys and see how they prepared and how they were ready for every game. And he kind of learned from them as well. So he's a smart individual. He was able to learn from people. He was able to understand what, you know, made him successful and what got him in trouble. And that's not to say he still doesn't, but obviously does it a lot less than he had early in his career. But that's where Brad Marchand to me is an unbelievable player uh, has made himself into an unbelievable player where it's when anybody watched him his first year or so would never have thought he'd be as good as he is right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, he is unbelievable. He is something special. Oh, you had, you had to tell him not to lick people yeah, and stuff lick like anybody, that. Though. <laughs> I mean, like an uppercut you know, and lose your tongue. Hey, unfortunately, though, you know how it is with some of these guys, though, Claude, man. They're great players, but, you know, when you when you become a sideshow at times, yeah. then people talk about that, and that overshadows your ability on the ice. Well, exactly, and that's you just said it too, Cam. I think we talk about licking and all that stuff. There's some stuff that were, you know, like cross the line. You know, it's okay to be, you know, in somebody's face or say things, and he does. You know, you ask anybody has some of the best one-liners going, but uh, obviously that's got to settle down a little bit too today with the obviously all the sanctions being put out there for things that you're saying that are crossing the line. But you know, he's he's one of those guys that's really sharp uh, and also. Like I know he said things to the other bench that not only was sharp but made the other bench laugh as well. He's a he's a funny guy and he's got mm-hmm. some comeback. But uh, that's Brad Marchand in a nutshell. That's that's when you know you're good is when the guys laugh at you. Oh, yeah. you when you're sharp when they're already pissed at you. Hey hey what yeah. what you think about uh, what you think of Tyler Sagan when he got to Boston? Oh I like Tyler. You know honestly he was a. A good player, first year player, and obviously, you know, we we're gunning for the uh, the Stanley Cup, and uh, but he was good enough that he played. I know we had made him a, a scratch a couple of times because we were going with a little bit more of a veteran lineup for the Stanley Cup, but uh, good player, you know. And uh, the unfortunate part is, I would say, you know, looking back today, as much as we tried to surround him with, uh, you know. When I say the right people, he was only an 18-year-old, and uh, you know, getting him a billet, he wanted to live on his own. Uh, you know, part of it was you know his agent supporting him and uh, and all that stuff. So uh, you know, there was a lot of things I wish would have been done differently with him. And uh, so uh, you know, the maturity level wasn't quite there yet. Uh, wasn't really ready to be on his own, and uh, so I think there was a lot of off-ice issues there that the. Uh, resulted in him probably uh, pushing the team to trade him. Uh, you know, in, in the long run, I wish we hadn't. Uh, I was okay with him as a player coach. No issues at all. I think a lot of it had to do with uh, what was going on away from the rink. And I think that's where the decision was made, uh, whether it was the right decision or not. Uh, again, that's what ended up happening. But like Tyler saying, as a player I think, you know, with the, I guess, the group of guys that were still in that dressing room, kind of like Brad Marchand, uh, it would have been good for him to continue to mature and uh, and get better. And I'm sure he would have uh, uh, been okay in, in the long run. But uh, he's turned out to be a pretty decent player anyways and yeah. has done a good job for them in Dallas. That's a tough trade, that's man. A, that's a tough one. Yeah, he was <laughs> doing his thing off the ice, though. Yeah, he Handsome was. little bugger, too. Yeah. He was a handsome kid. He, he was. He was. Uh, he was having some fun. You know how that goes. Uh, but explain yeah. Chara though. Like, you know, you're you're coaching this team, and you got this monster on the back end. He's leading your team. You can put him on in any situation. Like God Almighty, 
Like, like explain him his skill level, his size, how intimidating he was. He is so difficult to play against, and to have that in your back pocket, man, oh man, he just he just controls the game. Well, you know, they they always talk about you know you're as good as the people that surround you, and that can be you know your coaching staff, but it, it's also the players and the you know Zadeno is one of those guys that every coach would dream to have because as you mentioned, he was good at everything. And you talked about leadership. He was a great leader. You talk about a guy that nobody wanted to play against. He was your guy. You could put him against every team's top players and uh, he would give them a hard time and uh, make it hard for them to get around him with that big reach and everything else. He's also one of those guys that, you know, in this prime, you put him on the par play at the point, had one of the hardest shots in the league. Uh, after that, when we started moving things around, he was one of those guys you put in front of the opposing net on the power play because he could screen, take the goaltender's eyes away. He did it all for us. He really did, and not just on the ice, but off the ice. And, you know, uh, as coaches, you dream of having a captain like that that has that impact because everything we talked about, everything we wanted to do as a, as a coaching staff with the team, he was in that room reinforcing it. There was never questions asked. He, he believed in what we were doing. Uh, it was just a matter. He was like everybody else. It doesn't matter what system you play. If you do it right, you'll be successful. So he's really encouraging the guys to, to do the things the right way. And, again, you know, you're, you're a good captain, but you need the support around you. And you had the support from the guys I've been mentioning since the start. Had lots of those guys around him. So uh, as a coach, it was a dream to, to – to be with that group because you, you had good leadership and uh, you had good support uh, from inside that dressing room. All right. What was it like to coach Tim Thomas? I mean, like this guy was, he was interesting. I feel like people don't know a whole lot about him, like what he's all about. I remember you guys winning the cup and he didn't want to go to the oh, white house yeah. and stuff like that, which yeah. was really unusual for a hockey player at the time yeah. to like, yep. You know, stand up like that. Very few people had done that in hockey. It's kind of frowned upon too. Yeah, we see it in of... some other sports and stuff like that. But such a interesting like character and like an unknown personality, really. Yeah, and and Tim and you hear that a lot. Goaltenders are different, right? But uh, Tim was a different uh, type of guy. Not a bad person by all means. He was a good person. I got along really well with him. We had some good conversations and everything else, but. Tim had his own way of thinking. Tim did his own stuff that he believed uh, worked well for him. And sometimes it didn't always, I guess, blend in with what we were trying to do. But at one point, it was almost like, you know what? If Tim is stopping the puck, let Tim do his stuff. And that's exactly what happened the year we won the Cup. Uh, I remember at home, what we would do the night before a game, we would have the players come to the hotel and uh, sleep at the hotel so you could get a good night's sleep. And what we had done, we'd say, guys, be there by at least 9 o'clock at the latest. Uh, that way you can be at home, you can have supper with your family, you can put the kids to bed and all that stuff, then come to the hotel, go to sleep, and then, uh, you know, in the next morning have a great breakfast with the team and come to the rink. So uh, we had guys checking in, and then the trainer would call me when a trainer would stay there and say, they've all checked in. Well, Tim was checking in, uh, whatever, after our – afternoon practice the day before and uh would go and check in and then would go home and would never come back and uh, we kind of found out about that and uh so uh as a coaching staff and then with uh, again the four group we said you know what what should we do about that guys you know and uh players were good about it they said listen as long as he's stopping pucks we're okay with it everybody else going to continue to do it we're not going to complain uh we're okay with it are you guys okay with this coaching staff? He said, well, as long as it's, that's the way you guys see it, uh, we're good with it. And uh, But that's where Tim, for him, he felt like he slept better at home and uh, did his own stuff. So all that to say, that's what you dealt with with Tim at times. But when you looked at Tim, the goaltender, you couldn't find a bigger battler than Tim Thomas. He would not quit on any pucks. He would battle right to the end. Uh, his style wasn't... Uh, the, 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 I guess the butterfly style that we're used to seeing, but he made the saves he had to make. And uh, I think everybody respected him and appreciated him for that. Yeah. So uh, that, that's the thing when you have a, you know, 23 players on your roster, you can't expect them all to be the same. 
No. And he, he would compete his ass off. There's oh, no way. Yeah. Hey, I used to do that club, by the way. I used to go to the USA Hockey, uh, the coaching clinics. I'd go there, and I'd sign my name. I'd check in, and then I'd leave, and then I'd come back when it was over just to get my certificate, you know? So, like, the- <laughs> Jesus, Andy. <laughs> well, he said Tim Thomas. He would just check in, he'd check his name into the hotel, but never show up. <laughs> oh, man, that's amazing. Are you my question to you is, are you coaching? I am. I he am. He is coaching yeah. AAA Blues. And I don't think they've lost a game in two years. <laughs> hey. hey. So you know, now I know what I should have done then in the long run. Oh, yeah, exactly. Well, they don't make you They don't make you guys go to those coaching clinics. Well, we man. got a lot of talent coming it, out of St. Louis, Claude, it, too, and it's, man. It's these all are, day long. Yeah. yeah, I'm not surprised to hear that, man. I love hearing those stories too, about man. these guys because, you know, there is a personality behind the mask, obviously, with a goaltender like that. Hey, remember uh, – Milan Lucic, man, we, oh, we, we had him on, but him. also when Ryan Miller, man, we've talked to them about when he ran Ryan Miller. <laughs> and I love your comments after the game, uh, Chloe, when you were like, uh, I, don't, I don't think it was intentional. It didn't look deliberate to me. <laughs> Come on now. Well, I love it. I love it. Uh, as you know, guys, you're, you're, you're a coach that's always going to protect your players, right? Yeah. Even if it's uh, not the right answer, it's, it's the right answer at the time. So, but... Uh, yeah, that was quite uh, – and Ryan Miller had come out and way out of his net. And uh, we saw that again uh, with uh, him uh, against – was it Edmonton, right? When he went over Smith. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Did. But that time, was, that time you could tell it was accidental and uh, he looked more like he lost his balance. But uh, uh, can't say the same about when it was against uh, Miller that time. But uh, uh, you talk about you talk about Luchik and uh, – he was such a good player for us. He really was. And uh, uh, in his young younger years, he came in as a 19-year-old and fought his way through and made a name for himself. But you know, where people didn't, uh, I guess, appreciate him as, as much uh, was for his hockey ability. And with us, he was a top-two-line player. Uh, he was scoring goals, uh, putting up points. And uh, with the right people, I know he played a lot with Kretschy and some of his best years, he had uh, Nathan Horton next to him. That line was incredible for us. So uh, he did, and I know he had some. Uh, he's run into some obstacles at times where it's been challenging for him. But uh, nonetheless, uh, I have nothing but good things to say about Milan. He's such a good person when you know him personally and all that stuff. Good heart, cares about a lot of things, and uh, happy to see that he's still playing. And uh, I think he's played a, a decent role there in Calgary. Yeah, oh yeah, he is. No, he's he's making things happen. And you know what? God, he would get that crowd going. He would play minutes, and then you had Sean Thornton to take care of the big boys, so he didn't have to deal with the bullshit. I mean, it was like a it was a it was a perfect combination to have those two guys on the team. Yeah, we did, and you know, I, I can't remember we had Adam McQuaid as well. Oh God, he yes. was un- un- underrated oh, my, toughness, knock, man. He knocked guys out. Yeah, he did. Oh, jeez. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, we were really comfortable as a team back then. To, again, I talked about my junior team. Uh, that had uh, all the elements. I think we did too, you know, and when Sedano Chera didn't have to fight much, but when he did, I don't think anybody could could, could even get their arms close enough to his face. But, uh, you know, we we had a lot of toughness, and uh, but yet we played it the way we had to until the uh, team started pushing us around. Hey, was it 2013 when you guys had that crazy comeback oh, against yeah. Toronto? <laughs> where, oh. where they're up. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Toronto. They, they've been through it all. Yeah. Claude. Oh, God, Claude. And, and so, all right, what are you telling your team after the second period? Yeah. And, like, just take me back to, like, that third period. You guys come back and yeah. tie the game, end up winning in overtime, I think, man. But just, like, those, yeah. those things don't yeah, happen either. That's amazing yeah. just to, like, you know, kind of – when just watching it live was crazy. Yeah, no, we uh, – I still remember that to this day where it was 4-1 Toronto in the third period. And uh, we had just, we just finished talking about Milan Lucic, but I was telling the players, you know, let's take a deep breath here. Let's just go back at it one goal at a time here. And, you know, you're trying to calm your players down and and all that stuff. And I remember Milan just kind of started ramping it up on the bench, say, you know, we're not effing done here. We're going to win this game. Let's freaking go out there. Let's blah, blah, blah. And he really, cranked it up he really uh i don't know if uh, the cameras had caught him on that but if you ever uh, had a chance to look at it you'd see him really get wound up and sure enough they go out there that line they scored make it four two and really got the crowd back into it whatever crowd was left because i don't know if you guys remember probably close to half the people left the building when it was four one they said they're done because i think there was 10 minutes left in the in the period when uh 
they made it 4-1. So, you know, again, we scored with the goalie pulled out. Uh, and then Bergeron ties it again, and we ended up winning it in overtime. But uh, you talk about a comeback, and I have to be honest with you guys. Uh, I'm behind the bench there when it's 4 1, saying, okay, uh, is this my last game? So, you know, you're thinking about that. And what people, I don't know that people remember this, but this was game seven. We had just played game six the night before in Toronto. So we were leaving to come back to Boston, and Toronto leaves. And they end up uh, in boss and we go to leave. We have, our plane has an issue. Oh, God. So now we had, we had to scramble in Toronto to find a hotel that could take us all in. Uh, we had to sleep there. We had to find a place to go eat before we went to bed because, uh, you know, we we're supposed to eat on the plane on the way home. So we had to find a restaurant that would stay open just for us. Uh, and then uh, hotel rooms. And then we left the day of the game. So we got there uh, closer to noon on game day while Toronto was sleeping in their beds in Boston waiting for us. So we we're already at a disadvantage. So all that to say, I, I thought our guys showed a lot of character and uh, you know, it was unbelievable the way we came back. And uh, again, one of those uh, that you'll remember forever. So when, when that plane's kind of messed up, were you like, hmm? And now you're like, you're in Toronto. Everybody <laughs> knows you guys. And so now you're trying to find a hotel. And all those crazy Toronto fans are probably like, no, no, we're booked. No, we're closed. And Claude's like, no, I don't yeah. see anybody here. There's no cars in the parking lot. No, no, we're closed. The chef <laughs> went home. The chef already went home. Yeah, we we'll got have no this food. chef make you guys food. <laughs> like, that must have been, like, you well, got it. Your, your brain must have been, like, going crazy. He's hoping there. you don't wake up with food poisoning. I know. Like Michael Jordan. Well, I'll tell you what. There's good people in, it's everywhere in this world, right? So every once in a while good people do the right thing for the right reason. Yeah. So we were fortunate enough. Like I said, we ended up, I think staying at the Western by the airport and uh, trying to remember the restaurant that we went to, but anyways, we had the pasta and all that stuff. So it was actually decent food. They were great to us. And obviously we took real good care of them, signed a bunch of things for them and uh, ended up, like I said, the, the rest is history. All right. Listen, uh, I want to talk about Mark Savard here for a sec, because obviously he's coaching now, coaching Windsor and doing, doing his thing, having a great first year there. But when he gets rocked, has the concussion issues, oh, yeah. you know, tries to come back. Obviously it just, it, it just wasn't happening. And to see a talented player like that have to go down the way that he did. I'm curious how that impacted, you know, the rest of your coaching career, like how you, how you looked at concussions and head injuries in general. Did that change how you viewed it? Well, Absolutely. I mean, we know so much more now about concussions, you know, and then they keep get, keeps getting better every year. And, uh, you know, no matter what, I, I don't care if it's game seven of the Stanley Cup finals and my best player gets hurt. Uh, if he's got a concussion, you're not going to hear a peep from me because, you know, at the end of the day, there's life after hockey. And that's even more important. And you have families that's even more important than the, the game itself. We call a game of hockey. We think it's the most important thing in the world, but it's actually just a job. When you look at it, we're doing that for a living. We're doing, we're entertaining, but we shouldn't be entertaining, uh, risking uh, the future of our life because of that. So I'm one of those guys that I've always told doctors, if you tell me he can't come back, you're not going to hear a peep from me. Okay. Uh, if you tell me he's okay, but he's hesitant at playing uh, and, he, and I need to talk to him, then I will see if the, uh, uh, you know, he's comfortable enough to come back and play or not. But if you tell me he's not, uh, you're not going to hear anything from me. But when you look at Mark Savard, and I remember when he came back and he got hit in Colorado in the corner and uh, stayed down, then he came back to the room. And uh, I remember after the period, he was in the back room. I went to see him and uh, he just looked at me and he started crying. He knew it was over for him, you know. And I really, really felt bad for him because, you know, he's such a good player. And, he, again, that was uh, the Stanley Cup year again. He was trying to make a comeback and uh, wanted to be part of our group. And, uh, you know, that hit just kind of pushed him out forever. Uh, so just looking at his face, the tears and, uh, and the disappointment in him knowing that he was done uh, has, always, has always stayed with me. So those are the kind of things that uh, you just mentioned earlier that, sticks with you so now you start looking at concussions differently because you know the impact it has uh in a way he's kind of lucky right now he's able to you know do what he loves and that's hockey he's coaching he seems to be doing a good job i know they 
won last night, so their series is tied at three with Hamilton. So uh, for a guy in his first year there, uh, he's having good success. So uh, hopefully that continues for Mark. Uh, I know that when I first got to Boston, he was one of those guys that had about 96 points, I think, but was minus 27. And I remember having a conversation with him, and I said, Mark, you have yet to play in a playoff game in your career. If I asked you, would you be willing to have maybe 80 points this year versus 96, 97, uh, be closer to a plus player, if not a plus player, and being able to play in the playoffs, would you make that trade off? And he said, in a second. And I said, okay, well, then I'm going to be asking you to do certain things with your team that will uh, hopefully bring it to that. And uh, we'll see where that goes. And he did exactly that. He really applied himself to the things I asked him to do. And uh, he became a decent player, still a leading scorer on our team, but also was a more reliable player. So kudos to him for making that adjustment. You know, everybody talks about Steve Eiserman that made that adjustment with uh, Scotty Bowman. Well, you know, Mark Savard did that with me as well in, uh, in Boston. So it's not an easy thing to do when you're used to, you know, putting up all those points and then having to sacrifice that to do certain things that aren't, really fun to do but you know we'll help your hockey club well what certain so all the you know we have a ton of we have a ton of fans that listen but like there are a lot of a lot of kids are in this particular situation and Andy knows this firsthand too tri- coaching triple a blues like you'll have these kids that score all these points but they are a minus player like what what are the little details that you told them to do differently well for me it was it was about reading the play and not being like not being lazy on the back check if, they, if there was two guys deep making sure he was a third man back, you know, on the back check, you know, not just skating for the sake of skating, but make sure you identify your man. And I said, <coughs> excuse me, at the end of the day, I said, those little details will go a long ways for the team. But also as a coach and as fans, they're able to identify those things or respect you even more. And I think it's more about when it comes to that stuff, uh, the skill level is one thing. What every player can do that not every not everybody has a certain amount of skill level, but what everybody can do is work and compete hard to do the things without the puck. And I said to Mark, I said, just one thing when I tell you this is that I don't want you to change what you do well, because what you do well, you got to continue doing. I'm not asking you to subtract something that you're doing well. I'm asking you to add to what you do well. Mm. So that's the biggest, that was the biggest thing is if you can add that element of the game that is without the puck, do a little bit better, then you're adding to your game, okay? But you're not just scrapping from offense because I said some of the defensive stuff you're going to do will end up in a great offensive situation or opportunity. So, again, you know, we as coaches, and Cam knows that, we're, uh, we're salespeople. We have to sell our goods. Yep. We have to sell what we're trying to accomplish. And you got to make sure the guys believe because if they don't believe, then they're not going to do it. So uh, that was the biggest thing with me with uh, Mark was to make him believe that he was more than just a goal scorer. Yeah. And that's like perfect psychology yeah, right there. Like you're, you're, you're getting them to buy in yeah. because you're telling them, Hey, you're going to add to your game. We're not, we're not asking you to subtract from your game. No. We're acting. And the fans ask, will love you. Yeah. yeah. Hey, what, what was your relationship like with Bruce Cassidy? Like he, he was your assistant, right? And then he takes over and, and you know, you hear some rumblings. He didn't have the best relationship maybe with some of his players. And, and is that the way it is right now in the NHL? Like, I mean, do the inmates kind of run the asylum and when you have a bunch of like personalities, yeah. especially guys who are proven, who are comfortable, yeah. they've been around, they've had a lot of success, is, is that more difficult to coach than a younger group that you're, that you're trying to push and, and get them to a certain level? I mean, and start with Bruce though. Like, what was your relationship like? And and you know, just talk about him a little bit. Well, my relationship with Bruce was really really good because Bruce was in Providence for so many years when I was in Boston. And uh, every year, like, you know, when we start preparing for camp, I'd always have the, the coaches from Providence with us so they would know exactly what we were trying to do and how we were trying to play. And, uh, you know, and, and then I would always ask their input as well, you know. And the thing is, you want to have as close to what you're doing up top in the minors so that when they come up, they, uh, they're not, you know, having to change their style or what they've been used to doing. So those conversations were important. Uh, 
you know, the one thing I never want to do is force a coach down there to, to do things that he doesn't believe in. And uh, so there was always a little bit of room for flexibility, but uh, always got along really well with Bruce. Uh, he was good. He was very knowledgeable, everything else, to the point where I hired him to come uh, with us there when uh, one of our coaches left. And uh, he became the, the coach for the defenseman. He also was in charge of the power play because Bruce has always been a good power play uh, uh, coach. So uh, we left him in that position as well. And uh, so we got along real well. Uh, Bruce has his style of coaching. And, you know, as people know and all that stuff, he, he's direct. He says it the way it is. Uh, but uh, always been respectful to the players. So my relationship was uh, was as good as it could be with Bruce. So no issues there. And, uh, you know, when he came up, and I'm going to be honest with you guys, and, uh, you know, I know you got along well with uh, Don Sweeney. I thought he was the guy that I needed for that position. But I also knew I was in my 10th year. and. Uh, and there was a good chance that by the end of my contract, it would be time to move on. Uh, like anything else, you know, uh, uh, you can still get along with players, but sometimes, as GM say, a new voice sometimes makes a difference. So I was uh, was not uh, ignorant of, uh, of that fact. So anyways, when Bruce took over, I was happy for him. I moved on. Uh, I think he's done a great job with that team, uh, and there's no doubt he'll, he'll end up somewhere else. I mean, uh, his team's always been well prepared and plays well, but you know, there's always things maybe we don't know, and that's why, you know, I I, I always try and uh, talk about the things I know about the guy, and not necessarily things I don't know. I don't know if there was anything else going on behind closed doors that we're not aware of, but uh, I do know that he did a great job. I do know that he he's a good coach, very knowledgeable, and uh, I enjoyed working with him. Claude, remember when uh, Dale Hunter accused you of, of headhunting Nicholas Backstrom? <laughs> what was that all about? Dale. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and needless to say, I played a little bit with uh, with Dale when I was with the Nordiques, right? I was in the minors, got called up and played against Dale when he was in uh, Sudbury Junior Hockey and I was in Windsor. So uh, there was a long history with Dale and I. So it was kind of, I thought that was a little funny coming from a guy who, uh, but was it Turzone that the uh, yeah. oh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, Pierre? Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, the kettle called the kettle black, right? So <laughs> the uh, that that's Dale. But Dale is such a funny guy. He probably knew exactly what he was saying and knew it would come back that way. Of course. He of course. does not care the least bit. Like you just watch him on TV. Does he ever have his tie uh, not all the way up? He's got the loose collar. Is it? And he loves, he loves, the more you bug him, the more he loves it. So mm. that's right mm. down at Dale's alley. Hey, you think Bergeron will play again? Like, he, he must be the best player you've ever coached, by the way. Just quickly about Bergeron. I mean, I don't know what else you can say. He just won his fifth Selkie, but coach's dream or what? Well, but it's, it's definitely a coach's dream, you know, because, like, there, there's, no, there's no negative thing you can say about a guy. He's such a good person off the ice. He's kind. He's humble. He's all the stuff that anybody would look to into in a person on the ice, he's as reliable as can be two way player can score, can defend, can do everything great in the dressing room. Uh, like, I don't know that there's even a person that does not like Patrice Bergeron that's ever got to know him. So, you know, there's so much good to say about a guy like that. He definitely is a, a coach's dream. Probably, you know, a guy that the, uh, any coach, would consider the best player that, that he ever coached for all those reasons. Yeah. Hey, yeah, listen, too. a few more things for you, then we'll let yeah. you go, man. You've been great. Uh, I'm curious. You go at, you go to Montreal, and they bring in this cock and Niemi kid, just very cocky and uh, uh, cock and Niemi. Figure it out, Andy. <laughs> and, <laughs> like, and he had all these expectations. You know, he's like third overall pick. And, you know, they draft him ahead of, like, Brady Kachuk and some of these other guys they could have had. But do you know right off the bat, are you, are you saying, well, this is going to be a challenge? Like, the fans think he's this, but you know he's this, and he's not what they think he is, and he may never be what they think he's going to be because of his draft position. And what was your take on that, and how difficult is that when you have the fans thinking that a player may be something that he's not? Well, you know, if, when it comes to that, I think that there's, there's blame to be put uh, – probably a little bit everywhere. And what I mean by that is that 
you know, first of all, he just drafted third overall. I know he was injured for probably half the season or something like that. And, uh, you know, we, we really needed a centerman. Uh, we needed size up the middle. He seemed to fit the profile because, again, uh, I'm just a coach. I haven't seen him play. I'm going by what I'm being told. And, you know, he comes to camp, and he has an unbelievable camp. He really did. He's, uh, you know, probably the best I've seen him play uh, ever since he's been in the league with his training camp. And it was almost like our first intuition was let him come to camp and then let's just send him back to Finland to play back home and uh, let him get some more experience. But he was so good and held his own so well that we had meetings about that. Say, Christ, we, we can't let him go. Like, this guy's too good right now that he really feels like he belongs. And he started the season the same way he had training camp, really had a good start. I think that's where maybe when I say things went a little bit south is that it eventually started catching up. But he's an 18-year-old. He's been, the fans are loving him. He's the most popular player at the time. Uh, I don't know if he had the maturity to handle that kind of attention. And uh, I think some of the approach to his game kind of slipped. And uh, and you guys know where I'm going with this, right? Yeah. So all of a sudden, you know, it kind of slipped. And all of a sudden, maybe thinking he was better than, than what he really was and that he still needed to work a lot on certain things. So uh, I know players tried to help him out. We tried to help him out. There was times where it was a challenge, you know. And, uh, yes, you know, we got to the playoffs and uh, we put him in the playoffs and had some success there as well, you know, scored some big goals for us. So I, I don't know if he was really handling the success the way he should have. And that might have thrown him off a little bit. So uh, as you could tell, there was times where he was a healthy scratch, I know, with the uh, with Ducharme and the playoffs and all that stuff. And it created a lot of, as you know, in Montreal where everything is bigger than it should be, but uh, created a lot of discussions and all that stuff. And then, as you know, the Carolina uh, offer came through. And, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if, you know, as, a, as an agent, as a player, they thought it was the right thing to do and they chose to jump ship. So uh, it's a real strange situation. Would he have been better to be a, have been sent back to, to Finland. Uh, when you see what happened after the start, uh, absolutely. Uh, when you look at the start, it's almost like not sure we had a choice to send him right away. Uh, not sure we had enough depth to get rid of him during the season when the, those decisions were being made. But in the long run, I think he could have benefited from, uh, from being away from the NHL for another year. But uh, again, that's just an opinion from what I saw. Yeah. And uh, yes, you know, when you look at him in Carolina, uh, I don't think there was a lot different than what he did in Montreal. Uh, when I looked at his ice time, he was averaging you know, 12, maybe sometimes 14 minutes. But, you know, he was a third line uh, utility guy, I think, when you look at the ice time he had. So, you know, he's still young. He still has, I think, with the right approach, he still has a lot of potential and could become a better player. I really think at this stage right now, it's going to be up to him. Yeah. Well, he got that big contract he in did. Carolina, too, yes, so we'll see did. how that plays out. Hey, what was Bergevin? Yeah. What, what was he, like, you know, working for? Was he around oh. a lot? Like, did you did you get along with him? I got along really well with, with Mark. And, uh, you know, what you see is what you get from Berg. He's a really passionate, uh, really emotional guy. But he's also, uh, like, he's, he's a fun guy to be around. He can be funny. He can be uh, and all that stuff. And he did. He did let me work, and uh, he, he uh, you know, listened to what I had to say, respected my opinion, and uh, we had some good chats and all that stuff. Uh, I, I think at the end, and this is, again, me talking, I think at the end he might have been burnt out. Yeah. Uh, as you know, there's a lot of pressure there in Montreal and trying to please everybody, and uh, not only everybody, the fans, and trying to make the team competitive, but also the ownership and all that stuff, you know, because he cared. The one thing you can never take away from Mark Bergevin is he cared about that team. He really wanted the team to do well. But I think being a guy from Montreal, I think the pressure that was added on his shoulders took its toll. And uh, and I, I get a feeling that the, he was burning out there at the end. Yeah, I've heard other people say the same thing. I, and I don't not. know how could you not. Exactly. Not just, just a lot of pressure. Uh, and, and what was it like for you to watch the team 
like you get let go and 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 they go on that run in the playoffs and you know you had to coach through COVID and all that, yeah, which was goofy. just ridiculous. But and then they go to the the Cup final. Was that difficult for you to watch? Did you watch the games? Like, what was that like for you? Well, I did. You know, and uh, to be honest with you, when when we were let go, and I'm talking about Kirk Muller yeah. and myself, we were actually finished playing two games in Ottawa, so we were driving back to Montreal. Kirk and I were both talking, and uh, we talked about how we really liked the team, the players and all that stuff, and that even though we'd been fired, you know, we were hoping those players would have some success. And I know the season, the rest of the regular season wasn't great, but they made the playoffs, and uh, if anything, they played their best hockey at the right time. And uh, the, there's no doubt it starts with Terry Price and Nets, but that, let's not take away credit where credit is due. I think the team in front of them also played their best hockey of the year at that time. So, you know, was I happy for him? Absolutely. Uh, was I a little bit sad? Sure I was because, you know, you wish you were there with him uh, versus watching him. But uh, for the players' sake, I uh, was really, really happy for him. Yeah. All right. Are you, are you still hoping to coach? Like, has anybody called you? Like, there's all these job openings right now. now after this podcast, just so you know, Claude, you better uh, get ready. Hey, uh, have some family time while you yeah. can. Uh, all these job openings now, like, are you are you, are you you hoping to jump back in? Like, what's your approach now moving forward? Well, I have to written it off, guys, because, you know, I still love coaching. As you as I told you earlier, I did the Team Canada stuff and really enjoyed it. Uh, I think, you know, under the right circumstances, and I mean, not just for me, but for both, uh, I would definitely consider it. Uh, if not, then maybe I'll just move on and see what else I can do in the in the industry. But uh, mm-hmm. would definitely uh, be open to coaching again. But uh, you know, when you've been coaching this long, you want to get into a situation where you're working hand in hand with the people that you're that are above you and with the same goal and uh, looking to accomplish the same thing. So that's what's most important for me right now. Is not necessarily about winning the Stanley Cup could be about rebuilding it could be about you know know, bringing some young guys along it doesn't matter to me as long as we're you know we're on the same page yeah Yeah. well listen man you've been great and i I covered a couple of the games in the stanley cup final in 2011 i remember sitting in your press conferences a couple times and like being honestly like impressed with the way you handled yourself how you answered the questions and all that man so always classy and claude you were great to me too and i'll never forget it man i'll never forget it so i appreciate it well cam i'll touch I'll tell you what, we didn't get a chance to talk to you, but uh, I'll tell you one thing, and, and uh, I don't know if this is going to ruin your podcast, guys, but uh, Cam was as delightful a player to deal with as you could <laughs> find. Uh, really, no, he was, he, was, he was always polite, always respectful. He went out there and did his job, and he was an intense player when he was on the ice, and he did his job really well. But, you know, it's, it's like that good player that has a dual personality. On the ice, he was that player. Off the ice, you couldn't have asked for a more respectful, good person, and really enjoyed coaching him. And uh, I was, I wanted to make sure I mentioned that at some point, but I said maybe that'll uh, uh, ruin hey, your podcast. Uh, uh, Claude, I'm a princess to- now. I'm a princess <laughs> now, Claude. Claude, <laughs> hey, hey, why didn't you use him in a shootout? I don't get on with yourself, Andy. <laughs> I would have toe picked. <laughs> hey, Claude. Yeah. Thank you for everything. You're the man. All I the best you coming to you. on. It's yep. good to hear your voice again. By the way. Same thing, guys, and I appreciate being on, and uh, you got guys asked me to come on with you. It's been a blast. Thanks, yeah, Claude. It's been fun, man. Take All care. Right. Enjoy the summer. See you, bud. The Camastrick Podcast is brought to you by Bellman and Bellman.com. B-E-H-L-M-A-N-N.com. Get out there to Detroit, Missouri. Check it out on one side. You got the Buick, the GMC. Options for everybody. Then right across the street, you got the Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram. Again, Find something that works for you and get yourself a new set of wheels in time for the summer. That was Claude Julian, baby. And, uh, man, he's, he's listen, very smart. Again, he watches it all. And you just don't ever know if he's going to get back into coaching in the NHL. I think maybe part of him probably wants to. But even if he doesn't can, there's a team that, you know, will certainly hire him. And he's going to, you know, have a job in hockey if he wants it. But, man, it was great to have him on. And, listen, when he's talking about Brad Marchand, it's – I could see him having these conversations and how much time he spent with this kid and basically management threatening him to go to the East Coast League if he starts running his mouth about not about get, you know being sent down to the American Hockey League. And so I found yeah, that very, very interesting. He was tough to handle, and you could tell. Look, he had his way, and it worked. And a lot of guys get like that, Andy, and it doesn't work. You know, and you're like, oh, okay. 
So he had to do what he had to do with him. And sometimes there could be a disconnect when you're young and you're cocky, but you know you're going to be good. But the coach doesn't necessarily know you're going to be good at the time. They need to, like, straighten you out. And he had to get straightened out. But, God, Claude Julian almost died, dude, in a mm. stupid fucking sledding act. That is so weird. Andy, when we talked to him, I had no idea about that. I'm not going to lie to you. And that what I'm like, why would they? There's a cliff. Wait, wait, what? No, you went down and there's a cliff and a tree that says hit me and, and die. And he hit that thing. That's so bizarre. I'm sorry, dude. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Anyway, no, talk to me. I, talk I, I, I had heard about it, man. And, and I wanted to ask him. I didn't realize it was that Jesus. serious, though. Jesus. Because he had, um, what's his name? Uh, what? Adam Cracknell on that team. I remember hey, I like talking. Him. Adam was a good guy, man. I like really, Adam. Really good guy. Yeah, I like Adam. I, I remember he was telling me about the sledding accident that went down. Oh my god! It was just crazy. What the fuck? <laughs> what's <laughs> the most weird? I want to see that hill look like. Why is there like a drop off at the end? Like, <sighs> I don't know. Hey, what's the most uh, injured you've ever been? Like, hockey, non hockey, whatever. Well, man, let's make it. Let's make it non hockey. Andy, I fell off my boat one time. I ripped my shoulder out. Mm. And I went to training camp and I fought one guy and I ripped it out again and got surgery. That sucked. But well, I think that's, it was that's up very irresponsible. Wow. What are you doing on the boat, dude? It's the offseason. Yeah, I thought I had a boat and I was on the river with the boys and I it's slippery and I fell off and I, I hit my fucking shoulder so blocks on it. I just remember that goofy. Yeah. But I was very anal about about doing stupid shit. I didn't ever want to get hurt. When you get hurt at a young age, and I ripped my shoulder out, I never want to go through that process again with the painkillers and all that shit. So I was very, I was very aware of that. But sometimes you're like, you're doing things like fuck. And anybody, you could ask any guy that's golf that does hiking things that they've hurt themselves and they didn't tell anybody. Like it just happens. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't like, hey, blah, 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 blah. no, I was driving the fucking boat. And I slipped off, jumping out to get something. Yeah, anyway. But yeah, yeah, like little things like that. But I had a number of uh, scary incidents. Uh, yeah, but what? I broke I broke my ankle playing football one time, tenth grade. Broken an ankle, out for the year. Out for the year. I'll me- I remember just laying there on the grass. And- Did they have like a service after that and like pray for you? Did you know the what? Whole- Did the whole school shut down and say we're never going to win another game. So. I was pulling the grass out of the out of the ground. I was so upset that I had suffered this injury. And the coach said, "What's wrong?" And I said, "All I want to do is play football." I'll never forget when I said that. I just want to play football. He's like, "Yeah." I just want to. <laughs> and then I, 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 and then I just turned sixteen. I, I had a broken leg. I learned how to drive with my left foot. That's good though. My, yeah, because the right, right foot was a was in a cast. So that was one. Um, yeah. I got bit by a dog for 20 in my lip one time. That was very serious. Kind of when I had to get 20 situations. Oh. What happened there, Andy? So what happened? my dog, my dog, Keep it short, though, but go ahead. my old dog, it was a cocker spaniel. Very crazy. Like this dog would like bust through windows, Cam. If, if there was another dog outside, yeah. like he'd go through a window. Oh, like, yeah. Crazy. One of those. I know. Oh, I yeah. Know. Like he would attack kids that came into the house. Like kids oh, were terrified. Lost kids, were, happened. <laughs> kids were terrified of Teddy. So. Yes. Um, one time he, I left like a piece of pizza or something on the couch and he got up to get it. So I went and grabbed it and he just turned on your mouth, in man. my lip. Did you, did you tell the women folk though, that you saved a poor girl from like a burglar or something downtown? At <laughs> and that sound bitch caught me and I'm like, you know, I saved this poor girl. Mm-hmm. He got me with one. One time we were playing pond hockey and someone put their skates over their shoulder and hit me in the I face. Think you told this story it. before. I think you told that story. <laughs> I told that one. Yeah, there's been some serious yeah, ones. Yeah. I'm about to get on my bike here again, Cam. You know, I used to be really into BMX biking back in the day. It's taking me back to my old days. And now when I get back to St. Louis after this uh, vacation, 13-hour drive in the uh, Chrysler minivan, yeah. which opens on both sides, by the way, not no, just one it's side. convenient. They're convenient. Yeah, they open on both sides of the door. It's the most amazing you like thing. Ever. Like vacation, though. Like you're like Clark Griswold with the kids, and like things are people are taking advantage of you. You go through Gary, Indiana, and they're like, "Hey, how do we?" Hi, sir. I'm Andy. Um, I like, <laughs> how do I get out of uh, Gary, Indiana? Man, get over here right quick. Go to that. Way. Hey, one time, dude. 
we were in uh i was with john roger great dude grew up playing hockey with him here in st louis coached together he played at ferris state university he now coaches yeah. over in, out in philadelphia and uh we were uh lost dude and like in the hood in like dallas <laughs> no no navigation i had this piece of paper with like this map quest oh, thing God, like the crazy. directions remember so i we stopped remember, at like a seven of we would stop at like 7-Eleven and I was like, hey, how do you get to this hotel? We can't find it. She just looked at me, gave me the piece of paper back, and she goes, Google it. <laughs> yeah, they own you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, she told me to, I'm like, ah, okay. So I just like, I'm like, let's get the hell out of here. Yeah, I remember my dad going through, uh, you know, trying to get places in the old map stuff back when we were playing AAA hockey, man. He never, he always found a way, you know. Like, I can't even get out of my subdivision sometimes. My dad always found a way to find something where my mom would take me on trips. And I'd be like, oh, fuck. I'd be so pissed because her and like another mom would be like, <laughs> no, no, get to the God. No, mom, focus now. Focus. Stop laughing. Fo oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. We drove through Atlanta. It's very hot oh, there. Don't get me wrong. We drove through. Yeah, have you been to Atlanta before? Hot Atlanta. We drove yeah, through man, we there. I played there, man. I fought Bolton there. I, I, oh yeah, in. you played against the Thrashers back in the day. There's so many buildings there, and they're all like it's under a railroad track. Built. They're built <laughs> yeah. so close together. Yeah. All the buildings, there's not much room. CNN I don't know how they, Did you go? Uh, it was the CNN headquarters right there. Did you go visit TN, the lady and TN, TNT? To take pictures with everybody. <laughs> <laughs> TNT. Is that what it is? Is it TNT or is it CNN quarters? I think they're both TBS, maybe TNT, yeah. CNN. Uh, it's all owned by the Turner Network. Yep. Okay. You're right. So That's they're cool. all they're all there. But the CNN Atlanta. headquarters, you probably be like, hi. Cam, driving cross country, like you know, you kind of get that car that you just are stuck behind, like yeah. the entire way. Like, you That's see cool. him, like You're you don't see him for like a hundred miles. Then all of a sudden, here they this dude on his motorcycle. He had a guitar on his motorcycle. Oh no. Hippie and boy. he's just yeah. cruising. No, he's going like 200 miles an hour. Then all of a sudden, like, he must get off or whatever. And then he catches up to us again. We saw him miles an hour that. Dude, he oh, was going yeah. fast, doing some crazy stuff. You ever seen those guys that would, like, stand up on their seat? Yeah. Oh, so he had a motorcycle? Yeah, like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what crazy. they do. You know, I stay away from guys like that when I'm driving. And you know what, Andy? Like, you got kids in the car. Just put it in the slow lane and go fucking 70. 72 and just fucking cruise dude and maybe you gotta get over when there's a for a, a big old truck or something or whatever but just like chill you're not making that much time cruising and when there's a motorcycle by you get away from them let them go get away go i don't want to fucking not i'm see in them. a huge hurry though man like when i'm when i'm driving no. like on a oh, road trip God. i just want to get drive, there i drive slow dude i chill i listen to music i don't have kids and i get that it's a different mm -hmm. animal i understand dude I started to fuck you today, man. I didn't mean to do that. Yeah, that was bullshit. All right, I gotta go because I'm in big out. trouble. Big I'm money. in big. I'm in big trouble. Yeah, you're. Well, you're getting fined again. Let me know what I should find, Cam. How much should I find him? Fifty dollars, a hundred dollars. What? What do I find him? Would I ever even like? I'm the best business partner ever. I would even so like, late like I'm finding you. I'm like, okay. Like I. <laughs> Although I did I put down on shit, but I kind of fucked today. Oh, and I, my wife's like, yeah, he, I feel Cam, bad. My bad. if I did this to you, you but, would absolutely yeah, kill me. They paid money. Kill me. And I fucked up on the scheduling, and I'm sorry. They paid well, I don't money. even know it's you had this buddies. golf tournament until like this not morning. Not my buddies, though. It's not like my buddies. Like, I would be like, get the fuck. They paid a lot of money, and I have to entertain. My bad. All right. Uh, they've got uh, lots of fire pits and stuff like that to do at nighttime around here at the resort. So I'm thinking about going outside we'll tonight. Be, we'll make just, more uh, of this one, homie. <laughs> they, they, they're selling s'mores kits in the market here for $20. Why don't you out, put the music on and have everybody sit around and then walk the beach and stuff with the kids. I'd do that and get your mind right and like see what's up. Like, who cares? You don't have to drive anywhere. Walk right to the hotel. No, we have to. We're no, we're going to dinner tonight. They're waiting for me for reservations. Oh, you're not right next to the right next driving? to the lighthouse. Uh it's like it's like about an eight minute drive. I can oh, Uber right. if I want. Dude, yeah, yeah. Uber, yeah. Uber, everything. It's an eight minute drive, but it's like three and a half miles we'll away. Drive. Because like, but it's so you gotta go so slow through this. You're a family area. time, dude. I, I can't think the way you think. Yeah. I can't. So, all I'm, right. That's why I don't have kids. All right. I'm out.
Uh, Claude, Claude Julian, man. Love having him on. Lots of good ones. Uh, and lots of good uh, other ones coming up. We got the draft coming up. We got a lot of stuff. Cam's going to break down the North American skating list uh, coming up on, on on next show. And we, we listen, this is just about to be throughout the course of the summer, though, too, man. We, we'll be going all year round. Lots of great uh, interviews once we get through vacations and the 4th of July and all that. So, as well, always, the Cam Mr. Can't... Podcast is brought to you by Hair Club. Again, hairclub.com. Regrow. Uh, let's see, restore and um, hmm, what's the other Refund one? Be confident, Re- replace, replace hair club, baby. We love our friends over there at hair club. Check it out today, hairclub.com slash cannon strict car shield, car shield.com 800 857 2481. Use that promo code cam, which is very embarrassing, I understand, but you know what? Now is a great time to use it and save that 10%. Get it done and do it today our friends over there at uh, bellman.com say hi to danny say hi to kenny and say hi to dale everybody hey dale kenny danny i, I did danny didn't hear you what <laughs> say hey, hi dude. to danny <laughs> danny hey, hey doing danny like what am i is he a Listen, child Danny? good god hey. Everybody, get, get to Bellman and Troy, Missouri, and check out these uh, Chrysler minivans, by the way. These things are very, very special. I had it going up to 96. Uh, they are fully loaded, Cam. The doors open on both sides. You can fit lots of stuff. We're very comfortable in there. Captain seats. Uh, it's very, very nice. So if you want to uh, get a good vehicle for the family, dude, look no further than the uh, Chrysler Pacifica. Limited uh, version, by the way. For the uh, for the Chrysler Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram on one side of the street in Troy, the other side you got the Buick, the GMC. Yeah. I saw lots of Yukons on the road too, man. Love those things. So check it out and check it out today. Zero carb life pizza. Get your workout in and on, and then uh, listen. Post meal is waiting for you with that chicken crust. Zero carb life. That's L Y F E. Use the promo code Cam and Strick. ZeroCarbLife.com. Check it out today. Listen, this adds to your workout. Over 70 grams of protein in one 12-inch pizza. That is true. They've got two options, buffalo style or beef crumble. So check it out and check it out today. They're expanding, by the way. We'll have some information on that coming up very, very soon. Uh, of course, Mars Blade. Check them out online, MarsBlade.com. Our friends over there at Waggle Golf. Get your waggle on. We're doing that, man. It's good to have our friends from Waggle Golf uh, join us now. We put the golf video out there, Cam, and uh, and now we're just taking our golf game to the next level. I don't know how you played today. If you were embarrassing, uh, did you tee off? Did you putt? What did you do today? Man, I'm a, I'm a rodeo clown. I'm a goddamn rodeo clown. Mm. Okay. That's it? Yeah, that's it, Andy. It's a par three, though, dude. You didn't hit me on the green or anything, or no? Yeah, I mean, maybe a couple. I, I just, oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> I'm worried. You're, you're bullshit me the whole time. Like, I had no focus. It's like having my wife mad at me. Yeah, well. I can't deal with it. You told me 2.30. Man, I fucked up. They were so slow. We had, like, 50. Very unorganized. Man. Yeah, very unorganized. Cam is being fined. And, uh, again, please help me out with what I should People find Cam, right. for being late today. All right, we're getting closer to 200. Think about the guests you want to hear from for episode number 200, man. It's hard yeah. to believe. We, we had Gretzky on like almost 100 episodes ago. I know. 99, baby. <laughs> Which it seems like yesterday. Yeah. All right, uh, I got to go, man. The bike is waiting for me. All Hilton right. Head is calling my name. The Lighthouse is calling my name. The the people from Hungary, the women from Hungary, Cam, they're everywhere. And um, I've got uh, friends all over the world here. Hey, get, them, get them away from me, Andy. Get them away from me. <laughs> at this beautiful resort. Watch out for the alligators. Watch out for the sharks. Besides that, everything is all good. This has been uh, Claude Julia, man. We appreciate him for coming on. Again, hit that like button. Crush it for us. Uh, leave us a, um, a comment. And uh, check out camastrick.com. If you've missed any episodes, go there and go there today. And you can check them all out right then and there. Very easy to navigate right around camandstrick.com. So check that out. All right, we got to go for Cam Jansen, for everybody, for Brody. Brody, what's up, baby? We'll do it again next, man. Thanks for your support as always. Peace.